We have three board members, a lot of people. Let's roll. Let's call the meeting to order. Um, first up is public comment, and I'll say we're having a vicious dog hearing first. So the, the first thing is uh, public comment on anything to do with a vicious dog, not the select board agenda um, that somebody wants us to look at or think about using. Yep. Just state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Holly Engel, and I understand your gravity of the situation just like. So it's not about the hearing tonight. This is about any other vicious dog. I'm just vision. saying in general. Okay. Today, using the equity and inclusion and, and, and standards and best practices and under all those umbrellas that we consider all the parties, even as grave as things are, are is there a time to figure out a plan or restitution that could be mediated upon, at least for a hail mary in anybody's situation, no matter what I always would ask, but that be held for um, any drastic, no matter what drastic decisions get made in life. So yeah. Any other public comment on a vicious dog? Not about the case we're going to hear tonight, right? Okay. I guess my question is, I'm Melissa Scalera. I'm the town health officer. Will you call me? Sure. Okay. I think when we start the hearing, we'll review sort of the order of events real quickly too. So. Okay. All right. Approval of the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. So I have a public hearing on a vicious or aggressive dog, public nuisance complaint. Um, I just want to state for the record that this dog is right across the road from me. Um, and so I have no problem staying so that we have the quorum. Um, but a little bit of a conflict here. Not really, I don't really know the dog, but I've seen it. Yeah, there's a big um, conflict of interest because your dog has been on my property several times. Yeah. He comes over to visit everybody. And I've had to yeah. call you before and retrieve Max. And I've had to call my own multiple times. And she told me to contact you and deal with it between us. So there's a huge conflict of interest. Where does that leave us in terms of a quorum for conducting the hearing? You need all three. Right. Um, as a body of five. So what it is is the potential conflict has been made known. The practice that follows from there would be for you to discuss whether or not it's a conflict that's going to be material and impact the proceeding. And then you get to make that decision whether or not. As, a, as an entity, whether or not so, any actions warranted. So, given that it is not Trini's dog that is the subject of the hearing tonight, that comes to bear on the question of conflict, right? Yeah. It's not her dog. Okay. Mine would laugh you to death. That's about well, what you'd get I out of it. So, it's not like chickens multiple times. And they go <laughs> after it. I guess the conflict is more or less, uh, you know, the town code, loose dogs multiple times, as mine is being addressed now, so has one of the town select board members. Uh, there are other incidents in the past that directly have impact on this hearing um, as neighbor to neighbor that we won't discuss today, but I just want to move forward with my dog getting my dog the necessary treatments, uh, getting fine taken care of vaccinations, uh, security for my dog, just move forward. Ayla? I'd just like to state for the record, um, well, Mr. Skrill has stated that he's called me um, about Trini's dog. I have not received a complaint about Trini's dog. Oh, nice. Yeah. <clears throat> I, when I was at his house and I have seen her, both of her dogs. Okay, but nobody has filed a complaint with animal control. Well, I, I have. So there's a okay. discrepancy can, between Can you and show that. me the phone records on your phone when you called me? Sure. Can you show me the phone records on your phone? Yes. Okay. Are they in the documents 
or uh, no, give them to me because that's we hard to hear. Well, the record, I only have one dog. <laughs> you have a large German Shepherd. No, I don't. And then you have one named Max, and I've had to call you with the one named Max. I don't have a large German Shepherd. There was a large German Shepherd on, on, your, on your property this last week. If it was, it wasn't mine. So, just in terms of how to move off of center here, the choice are you if you're comfortable with the knowledge of it, you can proceed with the hearing, we'll walk through all of the stuff, and then if the dog owner thinks that it's materially impotent, that could be the grounds for an appeal of whatever decision you render, assuming you reach one. So that's path one. If you feel strongly enough about the conflict, we would have to we opened, reopened the hearing that we opened in June and recessed out of concerns for due process to make sure everybody could participate. So that's why we're here again in August. We would essentially recess it again until there were a quorum of the board from that. You can't proceed with two. So it's basically a comfort level with where you're at. And that you can, if there's a, some sort of disagreement with that decision, that could become the basis of which somebody challenges it. If not, then um, you're basically just opening and closing. Uh, because uh, uh, and there's I've no other work around for the two, three thing. Uh, uh, as I've stated in previous, <coughs> And this is tangential to my serving on the select board, but as I've stated in previous um, vicious dog uh, animal hearings, I have I'm retired now, but I've had professional experience as a Humane Society Executive Director, and so I know some of the issues here. I know all the issues here very well from my professional experience, and I would prefer that we stay focused on the issue at hand and not introduce any tangential issues into it unless we render a decision and under repeal those tangential issues are ruled, just as you said, to have been substantive in terms of an impact on it. Because we, we have, we have a, a situation at hand here that needs to be dealt with. And whatever tangential issues there are, we can de deal with later. That's how I feel. I, I agree with you, both of you, what you're saying. And uh, just to be clear, you know, a vote by a party towards my dog and me is affected by a person involved in the situation. Mm -hmm. Just, just the bottom line of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just received notification of this hearing on Monday because the certified mail was not being delivered while I was at home, so I just found out about this hearing Monday. I requested the body cam footage from the uh, officer on duty because there's discrepancies in all of the uh, writings and I think maybe moving it to next month or whenever, sooner or later, it would give me a chance to get everything that needed to be done from the vaccinations, the medical treatments, uh, larger fence. Um, the dog is very old. My daughter desperately wants some back. Dean, are you implying that my dog was in any how, way, shape, or form involved in the actual attacks on people that's the hearing I'm for tonight? I'm not talking about any attacks. I'm talking about a conflict of interest. As no, I'm as asking you, you a question, though. Are you saying that my dog, which I have Max, had any involvement in the attacks that are part of tonight's discussion? Who knows? <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you. I, I'm Absolutely. talking about my dog. And what's going so on? So that's where the conflict would be. If Max was out there buddying along with yours and attacked no, was, the people on bike or whatever, that's where the conflict would be. That's what I'm trying to get to. I'm, what, I mean, what, was your dog attacked by the dog that is alleged in tonight's incident? Was my dog attacked? Yeah. His, or were you attacked? No, his dog attacked. Two Their people. dog has been attacking the chickens. But, but um, that's, that's, I, I'm not trying to stray here. Right. Are, are you the owner of the dog who is under the... There's still a few. I'm oh, sorry, I'm talking separately. We're having audio issues, it seems. Okay. And I know it's just to scream it is to fix it. Recording is awesome. It helps that we know that there's an issue. We'll, we are trying to work on it. I don't... Go ahead, Tom. You keep talking. Just ignore us. I'm just trying to understand what your role in tonight's hearing is. Are you the owner of the yes. dog who is alleged to have been vicious? Yes. Okay. 
put on the I think the, the, the conversation is whether you guys feel like there's a conflict of interest. If you feel there's a conflict of interest, we need to change the date. If you don't feel like there's a conflict of interest, we need to get started with the hearing. I'm not trying to say I'm not accountable. I am accountable. Right. I just want to move I just was trying to get clarity as to whether you were the alleged victim or the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I, I understand, sir. Yeah, I. August been impounded, correct? No. The dog has been impounded, correct? Uh, that's what I've been told. Yes. Um, yes. I tried to get uh, the allowance to go get the vaccinations done, but I've been told by uh, some members of the town or whoever is in the town office and Milo that I'm not allowed to get the vaccinations or registration done until after tonight's hearing. So. so that would then be delayed as well? Yeah, I just want to get, I want to do what you guys need me to do to get my dog up to date. A few months behind the vaccination for rabies. I've had it every year since. Uh, he's a rescue dog of eight years with me. So I'm 13 years old. He doesn't have much time left. I don't see it as a conflict of interest because Trini's dog was not involved. Well, it's not about her dog. It's... And Trini wasn't personally involved. She was not attacked. Um, and so, I mean, the option is if we do decide to postpone it, then your dog is definitely not coming back home tonight, you know, okay, so. Let's just continue. It's going to delay it a month. Right. If we postpone it. I want my dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not the chair of the I shouldn't be calling on people. Yeah. I don't see it as a conflict. I don't see it as a conflict of interest. But, uh, unless Max, Trini's dog, was directly involved in an incident in which your dog allegedly attacked someone. If Max did it in tandem with him or her, I'm not sure what gender she is, or he, he, she, they is. But, but um, um, I, I don't see how there's a conflict of interest just because Trini happens to be your neighbor and has a dog. Yeah, I, I hear you 100%. Um, if you were... I was told to bring this up, so. Right, if, if, but if your objective is to, and Trini, I'm sorry to just. Go ahead. You know, yeah, you're, you're the chair, <laughs> so you should just shut me down if you wish. But uh, uh, if your objective is to get your dog back as soon as possible, yes. and we judge in your favor tonight, then you're going to be better served by that than waiting a month yes, over no, some, you know, questionable conflict of interest. Yes. Um, more like just personal tension. It seems like it's more personal yeah, tension yeah, than yeah, actual yes. conflict. Yeah. yeah. So. So, that's, so, so I, I would, yeah. I, I would say we should proceed if we're all in agreement. Okay. Okay. So maybe just before we start, we've been having some issues that have been reported with the connections there. We've checked the internet speeds. They seem to be fine on that end. We are running off of the, the Wi-Fi. Um, so we're having issues connecting this machine through the wire to the ethernet. There doesn't seem to be a way to resolve it without kicking anyone off and trying to restart everything that way. It could also be an issue with the provider that's outside of our influence. So we're aware of it. Orca's here. This is being recorded, being recorded on the Zoom in the room. So we are hitting those markers, and we hope that some of these issues have stabilized or resolved themselves. So we are, we are trying within the limits within of, of what we're able to do in the moment. So I, we recognize that we're trying to work for, through it. So I apologize that there's an issue. Um, so hopefully it doesn't persist, but just so everybody in the room and everybody online knows. Can people online hear what's going on or we don't know? I think there's been some no. intermittency at least, yeah. <laughs> so we got no, you're, we couldn't. you're here in person and you're online? Well, I was online, but you couldn't hear. You could hear one in every maybe five, ten words. So you stayed online and drove up? 
Well, I didn't want to miss the excitement. <laughs> so I just little PSA. Yeah. <laughs> are, are, uh, wow, this is a complicated one. Are there people online, to your knowledge, that may have wished to speak at this hearing? No, I wouldn't be able to tell other than the complainant and the dog owner, the yes. only two names that I would recognize. Yes. Uh, so. um, do we have a chat there? Um, yeah. If we could put in the chat, it, if somebody would like, maybe they can try phone in phone number or it, something? It, yeah, well, it, yeah, you could try the phone in number and see if that's any better. Though I did see a report that that didn't seem to help for someone at least. But okay. if maybe we open the chat, we'll keep an eye on it. People can submit some questions there. We'll keep for when we get to that spot of the hearing, and that might be a workaround uh, unless okay. or until so. we can figure something out. Yeah. And this is the so if you can just pull the chat up so it stays, yeah. and I'll keep an eye on it. So, sorry, I was dealing with that. We've decided to proceed with the hearing. Yes. Okay. Um, so the basic rules we've done, these are the exact same ones you've done for at least two other hearings in the last year or so to year and a half. Um, what you have in front of you are those guidelines for, for procedure. I'll run through them just very quickly so you have them again and then everyone can hear them. I've already called the hearing to order. We'll go through a summary of what the purpose of the hearing is. I will provide that in very broad strokes for you, just sort of frame what the issue is. And then at that point, you will drive from there. Um, the general order we've had for these things is first you'd hear from the animal control officer, then you'd have the town health officer, then we usually hear from the complainant, and then we let the dog owner have it. And at that point, you open it up for others who have commentary to participate. Usually in between each of those people who speaks, there's a time for the board to ask questions to whomever they're talking to. We don't open that piece up to the full courtroom, say. That's you as the, um, the adjudicating body at this piece. And then at the end, where there's a little more of a public piece to it. At the end of that, what you have the option to do, you have two options. You can deliberate in open session, which is where we are right now, or you can adjourn briefly to a deliberative session. I think given everybody in the room, everybody online, what we would do, um, okay, that's good. Um, what we will do is maybe just because there's four of us essentially run upstairs into my office, and then whatever you do for a decision, you would then come back after you're out of deliberative session and announce here. And then that goes in writing within a set as soon as possible. Um, statute doesn't prescribe that piece of the timeline, though it prescribes some other pieces of that. But we generally try to do that inside of the first, say, 10 days from the hearing or less if possible. So that's the basic outline of the process. That's the one we've used for both the Weaver and the King hearings that we've had um, in, in within the last 14 months or so. <coughs> So this one goes back to um, an alleged incident in May. You have the information in your packets. This is the same information from June, um, where a cyclist, I believe, was riding by the property at which the dog resides. Um, the dog is alleged to have gone after the cyclist, bitten, may have knocked her off her bike, um, caused some injuries that required medical attention complaint was filed, that's the thing that kicks off your process um, per both the ordinance and statute. Um, and it was investigated by, there was a state trooper response, you have that report in your packet, and then both the health officer and the animal control have been involved at different points. There have been other things that have happened since then, such as the impoundment, which you could ask Milo about, um, which goes to a running at large situation after when you had opened the June hearing and then closed it you'd followed it up with a motion to essentially say that the dog had to be kept on the property of the owner at all times. So when it was found off the property of the owner on a neighboring porch, that was one of the factors that led to that impoundment. Others can cover that in more detail and answer any questions about it. So that is the broad summary of what is in front of you tonight. We'll start with, um Having Milo present what you know about the case. Um, so I happened to hear about the incident because I happened to be at the Randolph PD when the call came in. Um, and I talked to Trooper Flores and he sent me his report and whatnot. Um, I could not get a hold of Mr. Srill. 
I contacted our health officer, Melissa Scalera. Um, the two of us did go out to the house to contact Mr. Swirl, who was not there, uh, and the dog was inside at the time. Um, and also spoke with Pam Fitzgerald, the victim. Um, and um, during all of this, I learned that the dog had bitten two other cyclists previously um, that I did not know about, um, but it found that the dog had gotten loose and done that. Um, Ms. Fitzgerald can speak to her injuries, but my understanding and from the trooper's report was that the dog was tied out to an RV in the front yard and that it got loose. Um, went after her, knocked her off her bike, and had bit her. And then somebody, I believe, the owner's mother, came by and got the dog and put it inside. Um, one of the concerns I had when I saw the report from the trooper was that they was 90 degrees out. I did not see water anywhere. The only shelter the dog had was to shimmy underneath the RV for shade. Um, so I called uh, our game warden, Ella Klein, um, out of concern about a potential cruelty case. Um, as we progressed, uh, I got a call on Friday from a residence on Route 14 that there was a dog curled up on their front porch and it wouldn't leave kids and they were afraid to go outside. So I went down and um, picked up the dog. It had an old tag from 2019, which was registered um, under Mr. Squirrel's ex-wife's name. Um, so I knew whose dog it was and knew that it needed to be held. Um, the concern with the dog was that we noticed it was limping and it has a very large, at least you know, volleyball, basketball sized tumor on um, their Yeah, it's just a bit hard to tell, but it, it and, impedes um, its movement, the growth does. Um, the dog, uh, when we brought it in and they looked up its records, they had a note at the vet that said the, bite, the dog will bite without provocation. Um, we had put the dog in the kennel without issue, and then um, when Warden Klein came over with me later that evening, walked the dog out so she could take pictures of the growth because it didn't appear to be being treated, and then he would not go back in the kennel. Um, even the slightest brush against his fur near that tumor would cause him to snap. Um, when we we couldn't gently move him, and when the clinic folks got a muzzle, um, he got very snappy and bitey, uh, didn't want that on. So we got a rabies pole, and then when we tried, he didn't want to, he kept ducking away from trying to get that on him as we were trying to hold him and threaten him from biting anyone. Then he just started panting, got tired, turned around and walked back in the kennel. Seemed distressed. Um, we asked, and we're inclined to ask for a report, and she can speak more to um, those that situation. Yeah, so I've had an opportunity to talk to Mr. Squirrel about kind of the statutes that I'm concerned about. Um, we talked through kind of the tethered statute from the initial incident with the bicyclist, um, and then I talked him through his uh, requirement in our statutes to provide medical care for their, the dog. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to the vet um, this afternoon before coming here, um, and he advised that it's definitely a tumor. Um, he won't be able to tell if it's you know benign or cancerous until he can sedate, basically sedate the dog to do a biopsy. But that either way, um, he can he can see that it is causing the dog pain. Um, so it's favoring that side. It's causing it to limp, um, and any kind of like contact that the dog makes with that side in the kennel um, causes it to be uncomfortable. Um, he thinks that this should have been addressed previously, um, that it's been a, obviously an issue that is uncomfortable for the dog, um, but that it should definitely be addressed moving forward, and that would require a surgery. Um, he estimated the cost of that surgery to be anywhere between 
2000 to $3,000, depending on if it is cancerous or not, uh, which he wasn't able to say because, you know, it needs to be <coughs> procedures moving forward to determine that. Um, if it's not cancerous, it can just be removed and then the dog can recover. If it is, that's obviously a, a different story that is, you know, whether you treat that cancer or you choose to put the dog down at that point, you know, that would be the owner's discretion. Um, but that's the information I received. So in terms of cruelty, the right. dog couldn't be sent home without that being medically addressed. Right, yeah, yeah. There's, there are some medical issues that need to be addressed in order to be in compliance with the state statute um, to provide medical care to your dog, which I talked to Mr. Squirrel about that a little bit previous to talking to the vet, was that we had this concern of the growth that was on the dog. Um, and I got a little more information about that today before coming in. And obviously, I'm, I'm concerned with, you know, how many times the dog has bitten um, and whether it's, it goes after wheels or what, but it certainly hasn't been contained to the point that it can't get out of such containment um, to go after bicyclists riding by. And then the fact that after all of this, I find the dog on somebody else's property curled up on the porch, I'm willing to leave. Um, may I ask a question? Yeah. How sizable is this growth again, and is there any way of determining how long it has been there? Um, so the, I looked at the photos from the, the incident that I think we're here for, and you can see the growth is of about the same size in those photos. Um, I would have to speak with the vet. You know, I'm not certainly not a medical expert, but I could mm -hmm. I could ask that information and get it to you at a at a later date. Um, you know, I own dogs. Um, it, it's a pretty big, it's a big mess. Um, if I had to guess and put my two cents in right now, it's been going on for some time, mm -hmm. months, if not, you know, yeah, a year it's, plus it's that, it's, that it's been growing, but I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know I, I've personally had dogs with yeah. tumors and, sure, yeah. you know, yeah. when they reach that size, they've been there a while, usually. I mean, yeah. one can't say for sure. Um, and I did get to see the dog kind of move around, and, and, and it is, you can tell it's, you know, it's kind of under its arm, so arm bit it there. Um, so yeah, it, it is causing some, you know, lack like inability to move normally. Um, so it's <coughs> Anybody have any further questions? I think, before? Mr. Spill, I think you'll have a chance to speak a little bit later on. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there any further questions? Any questions? Yes. I'm sorry, what's your name? Uh, Bella Klein. Thank you. So next up is Melissa. I'm Melissa Scalera, I'm a town health officer. I was called by Milo and informed of this incident. Um, Milo and I went, I called Pam, I spoke to Pam. The story that I heard from her, although I think she's the best person to speak on that issue, if she's going to speak, is that she was riding her bike. Um, a large dog was chained to a camper. Um, the dog slipped its collar. The dog ran after her. She tried to avoid the dog. She went to the opposite side of the street. She fell off her bicycle and severely broke one of her wrists, necess necessitating going to give her hospital and then to Dartmouth for surgery. Um, my understanding, I, I am not 100% sure if she had bitten. I think she could address that best with medical reports. It seems like maybe she was scratched. But that being said, it does seem like the dog chasing her caused her to fall off her bike and severely break the wrists at the very least. Um, I we went down and tried to speak to Mr. Skrill. He was not home. The dog was there. Um, the dog was inside at the time. The month, one month before that, I had gotten a very similar report. Um, a gentleman named Michelle, I might not be saying his name right, Remillard, um, a native of Montreal. Um, was down on a vacation. He was biking with his girlfriend. Um, he was riding past Mr. Skrull's house. The same dog ran out, um, attacked him, and he says bit him and that it still hurts. He went to the hospital as well. He said that he spoke to Mr. Skrull, who was quite nice and sorry, and begged him not to sue, and that he would pay for all the expenses, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Mr. Remyard is very concerned and quite upset. Um, this got me to thinking, because I said, this sounds super familiar to me. And so I pried back into my records, 
um, and came up with a report from about three or four years ago, and the same exact thing, a tourist, this one from Connecticut, I believe, gentleman was riding his bike in front of the house, dog was either untethered or got off his tether, and bit that gentleman as well. He was inside the house during that. There's no way. Okay, Dan, right now they're doing, you'll have your chance to it's just take a note of what you want to. So. Yeah. The, take a note the gentleman so don't said that he was very surprised um, it was several years ago the gentleman said to me that he was very surprised um, because he seemed to think that Mr. Squirtle blamed him for the night somehow. Um, so I know that three people have gone to Gifford and one has been transferred out as a result of aggressive actions um, with this dog. I can't speak to whether or not this dog just changed, is vicious to everybody. There's a, a child in the house who apparently loves the dog, so that speaks well for the dog. But um, I will say that He's sent three people to the hospital, and he definitely doesn't like people riding by on bicycles. Any questions for Melissa? Have there been any other instances, any instances of this dog acting aggressively toward other dogs, which is something we see common? I can't speak to that because I only hear about people being bitten, mm -hmm. and I don't, and I only hear yeah. usually about things that either <clears throat> result in the police being called or the person going to the hospital. My, Milo, are you aware of any? I can tell you from being in the neighborhood, I've never heard anything oh. about it. I know our our prior pup went over and played with it. They did fine. And these photos that are there. in the packet seem to show someone with a really badly scarred and stitched leg. Is that the Canadian gentleman? Or? Oh, no, I believe those are Pam who would be oh. next up in terms of what okay. we're here for. It's unclear to me, okay. Is there any other questions from the board for Melissa? Any more questions? No, we'll move on to Pam. Stand up. Yeah, this here. So my name is Pam Fitzgerald. I live in East Randolph. On May 30th, I was riding my bike. Um, North on Route 14. Um, I went by what I now know is Mr. Skrill's house. <clears throat> there was a dog chained, I guess, chained or tied up to a camper. It was a hot day, it was sunny, it was probably in the mid 80s. Um, he was barking and barking and pulling on his chain. And so I tried to move to the other side of the road and speed up, but he managed to get free and he came at me. What I remember, because it was very traumatic, and as soon as I saw him coming for me, I was kicking and screaming, and he managed to come around the back of me and must have jumped on me, because I have a hole in my shirt, and a, I was wearing a neon vest. The vest was ripped in the back, unfortunately. We threw it away in the hospital, but I still have the shirt with a hole in it. And then he must have scraped my leg, and I, I you know, was kicking. I couldn't stay upright, and I managed to fall over, and landed on my right side. <coughs> I could see right away that I had fractured my wrist. Um, the dog definitely growled before it jumped on me, but once I was on the ground, I, I, it was there for a few minutes. It didn't try to bite me at that point, but I was screaming so loudly just for somebody to come and help me. Nobody that I know of came out from this grill house, but a young woman stopped. Um, and then some other people stopped, and the young woman called, called 911 and stayed with me until the ambulance got there and stayed on the phone with the 911 operator. Um, and then they, she asked the operator if I wanted the police to respond, and I, I said yes, only because it was such a scary incident that I didn't, I love dogs. We've had dogs before. Um, that I didn't want that to happen to anyone else, and I wanted to make sure that it was documented. And so the state police responded, and the ambulance came eventually. And um, I don't know where the dog went after that. I think maybe the people that stopped helped corral him. The only thing I remember after that was when I was in the ambulance, someone was screaming, who put my dog in the truck? Who put my dog in the truck? And that's you know, several months later I was on my way to Gifford, so um, I was treated initially at Gifford, 
where they um, tried to reduce it and set it, but because I guess they don't have an orthopedic on staff that does hand injuries, they were communicating with Dartmouth, so they thought they could um, set it again at Dartmouth and do a better job. So they sent me to Dartmouth about 10 o'clock that night where they reset my hand again. And then a few days later, I saw the orthopedic surgeon who thought that I would be better off with surgery because I'm active. I ride bikes, I swim, I kayak, we run. Um, so he suggested surgery to stabilize my wrist. So the next day I underwent um, surgery. Um, so I fractured both bones in my wrist. And so now I have a metal plate. I've just been out of a cast for three weeks and having um, therapy twice a week um, until mid-September when I go back to see the doctor again. Um, like I said, I love dogs, but um, it was an awful incident. It was scary, and I'd hate to see dogs chained up anywhere or caged anywhere. Um, Okay. Daniel, this is your turn to tell us what happened or answer anything or so make any I, statements. I'm deeply sorry. I really am. When I returned to my house, I tried to make sure you were okay, but they would not let me talk to you or see you. I'm truly so <laughs> sorry. Um, there's really not much I can say. Um, it makes every, everything that's been said makes my dog sound to be a, you know, an ultimately vicious dog, and um, he's really not. Um, he's a protective dog. I rescued him. He was in an abusive house. Um, I just, I want to, I, I don't know, I don't know whatever I can do to make sure that I can help you and follow through with whatever I need to follow through with. He's, he's an old dog. Um, yes, he's had a growth. It's been, it's been growing for about two or three months now. Um, I did get him into uh, uh, Malika's office with my mother, I don't know how many months ago, back in the spring, to get him checked out and get the shots, but uh, Malika was what denied giving him a sedative to um, give him the shot. And I said, you know, we need to give him a sedative because the sedative that he had was not working. Um, so I did attempt it, but I did not want him to get bit at that moment. So, um, I really can't say much. I mean, I can argue a lot of discrepancies in the reports. The chain being broken. Um, it says the chain was broken. Who was this person that put him on the back on the chain? There's a lot of unknown uh, facts, which is why I requested the body cam footage. But I am responsible as an owner of a dog that has been people. Um, I can't deny that. No. Can I help you walk through a few things that might help folks understand kind of the lay of the land? Sure. Right? So you have a, a house with a large yard. It had fences it has a for a period, fence. right? An, an area where the dog could go. Yes. That's right there. My dog was inside just recently inside the house on Friday. Yeah, yeah, he's terrified of thunder and lightning. The house that he went to is a friend of ours. Uh, the the husband that lives there, Nick, he is a friend of mine. He comes over to our house frequently. Um, I don't know why he didn't call me. He showed up. He has my phone number. I have his. Uh, he was, you've seen him. Yes, yeah. Terry. Um, maybe you can speak about this limping. 
I've never seen him. Yeah, I've never seen him once either. So he, he may have gotten injured. Can people identify themselves. Just so yeah, I'm Terrence Cisleano. I've known this dog the whole time. This Dan has had him. So um, he's been an awesome dog. Super friendly. I don't know why he's chasing bikes. He always chases bikes. But the growth, I just saw him four weeks ago. I didn't see any growth. And if it's under his armpit, like you guys say, that's easily admissible. Nobody rubs their dog's armpit. So uh, he, he may have gotten injured jumping like, over the fence. It's a five foot tall, five and a half foot tall fence. Yeah. My neighbors, I can't say if they have or have not been, but uh, there's some matted down area on the opposite side of my fence that's next to our house, and it looks like somebody had peeled down the fence. Um, I have no way to prove any of that, but that's the other for thing. him to jump over a five foot fence with an injury that is making him limp, um, I'm not trying to take away any sort of accountability here, but um, I'm, I'm not been cruel to my animal. There was a water bowl under the camper. The camper has plenty of space and ice to go underneath it. I was gone for 45 minutes. Um, I've been to Dan's house many times around the dog and he's always been such a sweetheart and I've had my children over. He's such a sweet dog. He's therapeutic. I've been there alone and crying. He was, like, was comforting me. He's very empathetic. Um, and I was at the house the Friday that he, the door, the back door was open because he's a tall dog and he opened the door. And he must have jumped the fence because I went, I was the one who called to, to try to look for him. I went to the neighbor's house because I saw that on the post and he was, I saw the picture and he was on the step and he was, he does not like thunder and lightning so he's very scared. And I've seen him many times <laughs> for thunder and lightning and Dan will put a thunder vest on for comfort. Um, He's very sensitive, but he's a very sweet dog, and that doesn't take away anything from, you know, obviously from biting and stuff. But I, I've never ever been scared of him ever. Dan, how how long have you had the dog again, and and where did you rescue? I got him about eight and a half years ago now, um, from uh, one of my students um, at the new school in Montpelier. Uh, I worked with nonverbal autistic kids and um, I got him from the house of one of my students um, mm. and he's been a therapy dog for all the clients that I've had now for the past 12 years that have uh, cognitive disabilities and um, never once have there been an incident with him. He's a very supportive, caring, and nurturing dog. Has he been through the Vermont therapy dog like no process? No, or? no. I think if you were in a room with him and you started crying, you would see right away that he is a um, very unique dog. Yeah, he's very very smart. I've recently taken in uh, two kids and their their father who have been displaced from the flooding, um, and uh, they love the dog. The dog was has been great with them. Uh, but but he has he he wasn't trained to like visit pediatric wars no, or no, senior no, citizens no. or prisons or no. mental hospitals psychiatric units or anything. No. So okay. Yeah. When everybody's done I'd like I, I can clarify a couple of points that I think there were some questions about. Um, Holly Engler um, called me this afternoon and she did inform me that she was the one that corralled the dog after Pam was attacked. Um, no, the the question of who did that. Um, and the call I got Friday, I was told that the neighbors must have come over, opened the back door, and knocked down the fence in the back. And that's how I got out, so I don't think he jumped up. So this is the problem. This neighbor thing is messing everything up. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be a lot of different factual writings on all these different papers. <laughs> I've been over this guy's house many times helping him fix break-ins, 
and all kinds of shit. So, <laughs> this is part of the problem. Like, you can't keep a dog inside if someone's breaking into your fucking house. So, like. Uh, you just need to tone down the yeah, yeah, language, please. I swear, I swear. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But, and there's really nothing. I, will, I want to do whatever I can to make sure that you get what you want. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm so terribly sorry this happened. Um, but in, 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 a, in a jury kind of situation, the facts need to be supported, shown, and documented, and looked upon, mm -hmm. and, and cross-referenced. Um, so you, in this most recent incident where the dog showed up on your, your friend and neighbor's porch yeah. and the lightning and thunder and yes. all that, how, how did he get out of the house? Wait. I don't know. I went to work. Yeah. Uh, I left the back door unlocked. When I got to his house, I was um, going to watch his daughter for him. Mm -hmm. the, the, I unlocked his front door. The back door was open. Ah, so and he managed to open it. He, I think he managed to open it. I'm not sure. But Dogs can get pretty frantic in thunderstorms. Yeah, he's afraid of thunder and lightning. Yeah. I know that story. It's a pull open door. Pull open door. Somebody he has had. Many incidents, though, of people breaking into his house. So that could be as well. I don't. The back door was open, though, and Bo was not anywhere around. And I started going on the sites to see if somebody in the area had found him. Um, but he has had he's had locksmiths at his house multiple times to change locks. He had to locks. And you can see where there's been pry, pry marks from crowbar. Uh, the local locks and other stuff. Mm -hmm. That does not change my accountability and what I'm mm -hmm. trying to do. I, my dog does not have that much time. He's an old dog. I mean, any dog owner would know that at some point dogs you know, pass on. Um, I'd very much like to get him seen and checked out and assessed, but I don't think Malika is the right um, vet for that. Um, Can you clarify what you said earlier about, did he refuse to give the dog a sedative or did you, well, it wasn't clear what you were saying He just there. walked right in and with a needle in his hand and Bo had been there before. Bo has been right. there multiple times and he, on his record it is documented that he needs sedatives. I had scheduled the appointment, I had the sedatives, we got there and I said he's not sedated enough. I do not want him to bite anyone. And the secretary said, well, you'll talk to Malika when he comes in. So me and my mother were sitting in, in the, the, the little side room, and Malika just walked right in with a needle in his hand and went to go stab him. And I said, hold on a second, he's not sedated. And he's, so you had previously been giving him the sedative the yes, night before or the morning yes, of yes. or whatever. And I said, you know, just for your safety, um, you know, please, let's sedate him some more. And he mm -hmm. said, well, why don't you just straddle him against with your legs or push them up against the wall or, and I said that's that's not he, he, he's been abused when he was younger um, uh, I don't want to get into that but he, right. the, he has trauma when people try to force him um, muzzle him mm -hmm. um, that's why he was like that uh, I've tried to put a muzzle on him years ago when I first got him and it was I got bit mm -hmm. um, you know, he went through a lot of trouble. And it's been eight years, and he's come a long way. Um, the, the, inc the incident from 2021, uh, my dog was inside. When I got home, my dog was inside. This gentleman was outside of my house by my mailbox on a bike. My dog was visibly inside. It seemed through the big bay window. So. This is the earliest incident of a 2000, bicyclist. 2021 should be in your packet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the only, the only way that my dog would have done anything is if he had reached in through the doggy door, which has been boarded up since the locksmith came several months ago, um, and it looked like he got scratched in the arm. Uh, my dog was in the house. Uh, we can't say that was a, a bite or not. 
at this juncture it's allegations, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Um, mm -hmm. What happened with Ms. Fitzgerald is, is a terrible thing, but we need to look and see what, what we can do to resolve the issue and make sure it doesn't happen again. And it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to navigate through. Mm -hmm. But the facts are the facts. And if you look at your paperwork from the state trooper and the <coughs> town health officer, the state trooper's um, uh, report, Fitzgerald included that she does not recall if she stopped her bicycle and then fell or if she was pulled toward the ground by the dog. That's not what I said. That's the police report. I'm just going off the facts. I'm trying to make it very clear. It also says by the town health officer, the same incident, victim riding a bike north on Route 14, a dog was chained to a camper. It broke its chain, ran out, and attacked her. She fell and broke her wrist. There is no broken chain. There was nobody that. Did you? Did you I get the? One, did, you get the did you get Bo off? Can I tell my? Did, my was Bo on a chain? Does that make any difference? Does it? The man in the orange shirt. So guys, on, we don't want I to go back and forth in the audience. Oops. The so. man in the yellow shirt that when I drove up. Just a witness. When I drove well, up, I was I was the car was slowed down. Can you identify yourself? I'm sorry. My name is Holly Engel. I live in Randolph. Mm -hmm. When I drove up, I wasn't sure if I was seeing like a, a fireman change brigade. I couldn't understand what was happening in the road. And far away from, um, what's your name? Pam. Pam. Uh, from Pam, they, you know, quite a distance away from Dan's house, they stopped, this fellow stopped the traffic. I'm going to call him the fellow in the yellow orange shirt. And um, I said, well, what's going on? I couldn't you know, understand what was going on. I couldn't tell. And he said, well, stay away, stay away, the ambulance is going to come. And uh, he said, the dog got loose. This is what the, yeah. this man in the yellow orange shirt. And I put, I put the dog on, back on the chain. He said, are you, are you family? Do you, know, do you know these people? And I said, yes, I'm family. And I slowly pulled in. Then I, I checked the, um, car, the house. Just, I didn't have a key anymore, but I checked to see. Apparently, my view was open. I don't know. It wasn't open to me. So I went to the, I wanted, I felt like I didn't want to leave the dog with, with this young lady on the street on the, on the dog line, okay? I didn't want to do that. I said I couldn't get him in the house. So what he did was I went into the mud truck, checked the uh, driver's side door. To me, it wasn't that hot that day. It was, I don't know, early May. And I and I, I arranged things in there so there was a, 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 a old a little blanket that on the seat nice and everything you know, it was just for a dog could sit in there. The driver's side door was secure, window was up. I left the right hand side window ajar enough for air and that his body could not pass through there. I was a retired nurse, I know things to look for anyway. But I, I was thoughtful of will Dan, I had seen Dan 20 minutes, 15 minutes up at Rinkers, just passing him. And he said, oh, I'm just coming right down to the house because I wanted to drop something off. And then, uh, and then um, I, I, I left after I got the dog secured. I went over to this young woman, and um, she was doing her own thing because she was hurting. But I asked, do you need help? Do you need a tourniquet? Can I get you anything? You know, you need a bandage, you need water. Um, is there anything I can do? No, 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 the ambulance is coming. I said, well, I just felt like it was, I should ask, you know, and if you should. And then I, and then they said, no, we need to go for the ambulance. And I got into the driveway to my car, and I exited away so I didn't have to cross her path. And then I called Dan, and apparently I had come right back. But by the time I came back around, the ambulance had already been going, and I don't know the in-between. And I have photographs and videos of the dog Bo and Rose and myself. And Rose has lost her, uh, uh, what should call her, her aunt, her granny, um, on her mother's side, and has some, during COVID, 
-hmm. And she's suffered a lot of her own, which nobody should talk about here, her own stuff that I am very concerned um, that that, even though I, I am concerned about anybody else getting hurt. Also, there's been studies recently put out about how small events that happen in a young child's uh, loss or whatever can actually amount to a more of a problem with post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. later on. And that's just a nursing, that's a nursing mother in me. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say I am offering whatever money in any, in, if they would like some money value for their injury, I'm going to take care of that. I will pay for the dog food when I was with Bo. He'd sleep on the couch next to me. I had videos, all this loving dog. And, and it was about a pan cake like that size. That's a small. And uh, as a nurse, sometimes things just, they, they grow fast. And he was not limping when I saw him. And um, I will pay for his food. And I will pay for a very strong, substantial fence. I would like everybody to hear that matters in this argument or disagreement to come to some kind of mediation where everybody's needs could be met and I could take care of the fees for all of that. And why not give a chance to everybody? And you know, and make your own within the law and everything, rules, regulations that have to be complied with, blah blah blah, and follow through. That's my thought. Can, can we back up a little bit to um, two weeks before uh, Pam was, I don't want to say attacked, or allegedly attacked, let's say, um, for, for the purposes of this hearing. Uh, there was the incident with the gentleman from Quebec. Yes. Um, what can you say about that? I can say, I can say, oh. Dan. Uh, my mother was over playing with Rose, the one who out front. I reminded her, tighten the collar that goes on bow. She forgot to. No, no, that's not true. Slipped out. That's not true. Absolutely not true. I'm a nurse, and I know that you put two fingers in that collar. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, when I took that dog, before I went out the door, I put my fingers in there. I worked with the kennel, too. Put my fingers in there, and I felt that that was that nice and secure. There was no leeway. And, and the dog wanted to come in. We were sitting in little chairs. He wanted to come in, he was whining, and I said, well, let's, we'll just stay out another minute. And then bikes came, and then the dog just went. It was terrible. And I, I, I So how did he get out? He was, he was, I brought him out. I put the, I put his collar on, I checked. I personally checked, I know, because I, Kept saying it's in my notes from a long time ago when mm -hmm. it happened. Mm -hmm. He slept the collar, right? Hmm? He slept the collar, though. He, yeah, the collar. He slept the collar. Oh, I, I don't have that. Was, That's what I was trying to do. It was still yeah. Yeah. connected. <coughs> it was not tight. I hear what you're saying about the collar open. I just want to say I hear what you're saying about post traumatic yeah. stress disorder, and it's, it's not directly true. relative to this no, case. Yeah. But hang on, but there are plenty of young people who have been attacked by dogs, who live their life petrified of dogs mm. because they were attacked when they were little kids. So it's a two-way street. Yeah. Just so you understand. And in that. Florida, I had a dog. <laughs> oh, I want to just say this one thing. It was part of his part of the Asian and, and, and we saw UBS and would always, always go after them. Mm -hmm. And I chastised him to get back in the house in Florida. And jumped through an old screen door, had his uh, feet stuck, and then chewed my hand. The dogs, some dogs, something Stop. like that, but yeah, they're I'm otherwise sitting. great. So, uh, Brenna, just let's move I'm this done. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so, Dan, I was uh, starting to walk down the path of the fence area in the back, right, yes. because you have that, and yes. I've seen the dog out there. Right. I doubled the that. size of it out there about the mm -hmm. house. And you, I've seen you outside with the dog yeah. out front, yeah. sometimes on a leash, sometimes not, but always in control. I've yeah. never. Anytime he's with me out front, he is under my control and does not do anything wrong. When he is directly with me and my child, whether it's down by the garden, we have another setup with the water bowl and another uh, ground stake. Uh, and a solid metal chain, just as the solid metal tether line that is four feet from the ground anchor. 
And the reason he was not on the ground anchor and tied to the bumper of the trailer is because the ground anchor looks to be like run over, or got bent somehow, and was very loose. So that day I put him on something more solid. And um, the water bowl was underneath the back of the camper where he likes to climb under. He's a digger. Behind my house, there's a massive, massive, my daughter. <laughs> a, a massive hole. He likes to dig. He crawls. But in. it's not close to the ground. That camper is. It's it's. 18, 20 inches up, correct? It's that much space. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like that's it's enough space. space. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's got. He's, yeah. yeah, it's about like a doghouse, right? Here. He's like a huge backyard that's all fenced in. Yeah, he can be shaded under there. Like, yeah. yeah, it's not like I left him outside and, you know, mm -hmm. left for hours without water or <laughs> without shade. I Just went down to the floating minutes. bridge to help someone load a, a small truck camper into the truck. It's done for 45 minutes. Um, I'm sorry that the state trooper missed the picture of that, but. Uh, you know, I think what was more important at that moment was the incident uh, with Miss Fitzgerald. Any other questions? I, I don't. Anyone? Anybody in the audience have anything they'd like to add or any questions? I, I, I'd just like to say that whatever. Um, I was actually a, a, attacked in town by a dog that I had reported to the Different select board. Different that we had. Oh, yeah. Randall. We remember that. Right by my house, yeah. actually. I yeah. remember yeah. it well it because right I house. have a permanent injury in my hand mm -hmm. as a result of the bite from that dog. Um, I think it's really important that whatever this um, you know, board decides, or whatever the select board decides, that, that there's a follow-up um, to make sure that the owner complies with the um, with the restrictions or whatever limitations or whatever um, steps the the board uh, needs feels needs to be taken, and that somehow there's a system in place for following up to make sure that's done. Because I got bit after the select board meeting, and quite a long time after the, it was a week or more after the select board meeting. And no um, follow-up with the family had been done in that period of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's very good that the select board, you know, looks at that, looks at, looks at it, and acts on it. But it's important that there be follow-up, and that the select board is monitoring that the follow-up is being done. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marla. Um, this was the incident on 14 at Tunbridge Road? Yeah. Yes. So I was out of town for that hearing. My understanding is the select board, when I received the report, required a dog pen to be built around the door, which was an inefficient one, but it was done. But the incident occurred because they had other doors to the outside, and they let the door, the dog out a different door. Mm -hmm. So that solution doesn't always work, and that was mm -hmm. a horrible incident that happened down there because that dog got out. I, I'm getting my maybe some of these past cases a little bit mixed up. This isn't the dog that subsequently attacked another dog yes, and literally skinned it alive. basically skinned it alive. Yes. Can we, re yes. can we yeah. redirect and stay away from us? Yes. Yes. Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just yeah. trying to yeah. respond yeah. to yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that whatever follow-up is I agree in this with, case I agree with you is, is real follow-up. Yeah. 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 I, I agree 100% yeah. with what you're saying. I'm sorry that you had to go through a traumatic experience. I really am. I don't Melissa? Know if for you. Hang on, Melissa. Uh, Hi, John. Maybe we should finish and then I have a question. So I think the main concern Daniel Spreel is worried about is charges for animal cruelty. Um, That's not this board. That's not up to us. That's not us. No. no. Yeah, that would no. be my. Um, so oh, I yeah. am responsible for enforcing state regulations as far as that are concerned. Okay. Me and Daniel have had a few conversations about the statutes and 
what he would be required to do to avoid those charges, yeah. including addressing any medical yeah. issues. Right. Uh, on that yeah. note, I would appreciate yeah. in the future if the town members in the municipal office were not telling people that I was being charged or any future people being charged with a crime when there has not been actual charges. Because it's been said to multiple people outside from this office over the past few days. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Because I was terrified when I heard it from him, and then I heard it from Milo, and then I called you and directly spoke with yeah, you. Yeah, we talked through yeah. everything. So. I think there's an understanding of what, yeah. what's going to be required to avoid that. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask a question? I don't know if it's my role. I, just to me, it seems like there's two issues. There's the safety of people, and there's the health of this dog. Um, you've offered to, Ms. Engel, right? Yes. You've offered to pay for everything. I, I've had a sick cat, and I can tell you how, how much money it I costs. Have the money. I have the money. Um, but would you be, you know, I don't know if this is germane or not, but it sounds like this, this dog's going to need an expensive surgery before we even know what's going to happen with the dog. I think, you know, as a nurse to nurse, when, when, when it comes to to see what the vet does. I, I tried to get in contact. I was told not to contact the vet. Okay. Um, but you're willing to pay I for the surgery? I think, well, well, let's go see what the vet says yeah, first. I would love to do, and I tried to. Surgery, totally see okay. what's going on. Just see, my curiosity. Sure, at least on what's going on and yep. what's the need. Yep, so oh, yeah. um, the things that it needs still is to determine the health condition. Yeah, so talking to the vet um, earlier today, his um, opinion is that the dog needs to get a biopsy to determine if the tumor is cancerous or benign, and regardless of either, to have that mass removed. Um, so I think the cost of that is determined by whether it's cancerous or not, yeah, of course, and then you very can kind of soft. make the decision on what you're going to do at that point. Yeah. Um, but at the bare minimum, what's required is a determination of Cancerous tumor what versus benign, yeah, and then the removal of that mass. <clears throat> the scope so of the surgery is significantly different. But yeah. that's not our issue. That's not our issue. Right? Right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. I think for the town, all we need we need the dog registered. The dog needs to be vaccinated and, and registered. It hasn't been registered since 2019. That's um, not true. My my rabies vaccination just ran out three months ago. He was ago. not registered with the town of Randall. Yeah. They're two separate processes. Two different things. Yeah. License versus he, he was registered um, after he got his registration. So. If it must have been under a different name, it was not. Well, if it was a three-year vaccine, what, yeah, you have three, to do it every year. So the last one was 2021, okay. and it's a three-year vaccine. It's okay. on this. Unless well, the time registration's every year, right? Licensing is every no, year. No, I understand that. I'm yes. sorry. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I was late in getting it. Yes, I understand. So uh, COVID time. kind of put me into a. Uh, isolation. So the town, it's just the the, the babies, but a current certificate and the registration. And then from the state, we just need the medical issues addressed. Um, but does the I guess where I'm headed of this is does the town have the ability to hold the dog if the state side isn't settled, or right. do you have the ability to? Um, I yeah, I would work in collaboration with Milo to to do that. Um, so in this case, the state supersedes the town, right? Well, not necessarily. I'm wondering that what I'm trying to figure out here is I don't want to have Daniel leave here thinking if he gets his rabies and his registration, <laughs> he can get the dog tomorrow. If the state's then going to say, no, right. we got to hold need, it We need longer. to address the medical issues, which I've, I've talked to yeah. about that. Yes. But we would also need to be addressing the medical issues and to get that procedure done in order for the dog to be release and, and to avoid any, you know, talking about animal cruelty charges. I know you don't want that, you know, put out, but that's what we're Yeah, no, I understand. Here, so. Who's holding the dog at that time, though? Right. right. Does, the, yeah, does who, the town... Who does have my dog? Well, Is it? The, does the town release... So if we come up with a solution tonight, then it's got the fenced area, yeah. it gets its vaccinations... So it sounds like the three of us need to have a conversation about financial responsibility and who's going to pay for this procedure, right? Um, so if that's going to happen succinctly, um, I mean, the dog is in, in medical care right now with the vet, 
if you're ready to start that procedure, we can just it can kind of just be continuous. Yeah. But I understand that's kind of two pillars that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I tried to start that process well, the other day right, before I spoke with you, yeah. and I was told not to contact yeah, we get or that go to the vet. Yeah. 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 I don't know that the town can hold the dog if it's a, if it's the state issue. If we address the town issue, I want I just been trying to figure out who yeah. legally. So I'd like to interject. It so the, the, the town. Can you just hang hold on? on? The board is having a conversation right now. Thank so you. Right now, the town has technically, I think, impounded the dog for violation of the order issued in June. So if the town issues are addressed, but the dog still needs to remain impounded. The, Does the, that transfer yeah, the, to the state at that point in correct. terms of? And then we would kind of take over from there, and we would see our process. Okay. 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 I don't mean to interject in the wrong way. I'm sorry. Um, I just want to say, just on the sake of. Your piece, no, I'm not telling this, you just a thought. Whether anybody pays something first, it, I think Daniel or you figure out where is this going to happen. The dog, even if it had the shots, I won't, I would not put the dog home because that, that is inflicting possible pain, which could make another reaction of sure. a bite. So therefore, just between you guys, figure out right. who is going to be the veterinarian, and then between you all, and then you can contact me on that. that. Can we just stop yeah, the well, state conversation? Stop. Like we're we're into this at this point. I I want to bring bring this back to what the town's responsibility is. Are you going to tell me what the town's responsibility is? No, <laughs> but if the, ta if the town impounded the dog via the health officer. No, I didn't we, we didn't. We didn't. Yeah. No, okay, because she does have the state statue under her authority. Yeah, but she didn't impound it. And I'm not sure that, I don't But she could. Well, but I don't know that we want that. I don't think we want that. Okay. okay. I, 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 I think, think what we need to figure out is from both. the, town's perspective on this hearing what what that takes and it's you know the vaccinations and the registration and then whatever conditions and usually it's the fence it's some things like that and then it becomes between between just you and the, and the state on the other part the town doesn't need to be involved in that for any reason so I have a question. So if we're, if we're going to hold the dog until whatever you decide is met for confining the dog at home, so it cannot, under any circumstances, and he'd be impounded at the owner's expense until all those were met, but before maybe that... This dog has cancer and it's best to just not even wake it up, then the vaccinations and fencing in a yard and yeah, not that's appropriately. And that I was kind of a big question mark from that. was kind of a big question mark from that. there until we get an actual yeah. vet to. Was that the dog needs to be sedated in order to do certain procedures? Yes. If it's going to be sedated, that's when he would want to do Let's, this biopsy and all that. And, and, and I would I would ask if it's if it's possible to have a different vet um, do this because and that's going to be at your expense. If yes. You're, yeah. Of course. But, well, you decide who the vet is. Yeah. Well, I I didn't know and I, until I talked with Kim on Tuesday, right? Tuesday when I talked with you. Uh, anyway, that. It was at Malika's, and I was not allowed to call or go there. And then Milo also told me the same thing, correct? I, I said that you couldn't get your dog back, and that you needed to wait until the call hearing. Don't go until after the hearing. So. Who, who was your? Yeah, we're kind of getting I, I just, I yeah. to get I just want to make sure I can get. Was Dr. Malika your former vet? Yes. He was. And okay. He was the one that I brought him to prior, and he did not want to sedate him, even though the records indicated he needed sedation. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. I think going to another vet would be. Uh, it's your choice. Yes. The, vet is on your yeah. dog. the yeah. question I have in that yes. is, in the meantime, the dog is still under the town's impoundment order, mm -hmm. and the pound is at Dr. Malik is not a different vet, so how do we arrange that to safely transport the dog, make sure the dog is going to, if it survives, goes back to Malika's? 
until such time as we have so it's I can transport the dog safely. That's not a problem. I can but work I mean, with it's you guys. Police assistant. The, yeah, no, the dog I can will work have to be transported in a way you feel is, is well, safe. To the question of sedation, Milo, I mean, I have a dog that has to be sedated because he's just, he's not, he's the most lovable, least vicious creature in the world. He just gets flipped out when he goes to the vet. Same um, my dog. I mean, totally like frantic, but not like biting, just like a nervous wreck. And so he gets two pills at night um, and then one the morning of on an empty stomach just to go for a routine exam. Mm -hmm. well, so so presumably, if, if we were to s see a switch of vets here, you would sedate the dog as you have in the past. Yeah, we had a lar I asked for a larger uh, sedative because yeah. it wasn't working when I brought it in. Um, Meloxicam or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, sure. we're going to... I just want to make sure that I can do whatever I can do. Um, take yes. a motion and then do it at the end of the night so the rest of these people aren't sitting here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I know that my concern is that if the dog gets transferred to another vet, that we're going to have to work with that vet, and then the dog's going to need to get, again, transferred back, probably with our involvement, to make sure that the dog actually goes assuming it survives, goes back to the Is, is Dr. Mollica the go-to vet for impounding dogs in Red? We have a contract. With yeah. Okay. 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 And it's a contract between the town and Dr. Mollica. Yeah, it's, we identified yeah. the location. So I can't um, think of any number of But it's, uh, I mean, I, I guess it would be Oh, between wow. you and Daniel on how quickly that move happened and that evaluation. Yeah, I, and I, I, I uh -huh. was told not to call until Well, no, we're just telling you right so now. What we're going to have yeah. to do is work with yeah. them. Well, I, do I have permission to call to that? Well, well, uh, would you be comfortable letting him do the evaluation, if not the surgery, at least to know what's going on? And then if you chose, if you decided to choose another vet for the surgery, whether it's benign or malignant, he doesn't have to do the surgery, but That's he could what, still do the biopsy. I'll do whatever needs to be done. Yeah, I'm just trying to. I don't think that's ours to do. I, just need, what? I, need I don't it. think that part's ours to do. Yeah, that's right? It sounds that's like it could even be a needle. It sounds like it could even be a needle like biopsy. Yeah. 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 To make sure that these things taken care of, and I've been told yeah. the past days I know about it. I mean, I'm not a veterinarian, and I'm nowhere near as probably knowledgeable as, as Milo and ha Holly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Bella and Bella. Bella, sorry. Um, <laughs> It almost sounds like this could be a, almost like a needle biopsy. It may not even be that invasive. So he could do that, and then if you wanted to take the dog to Bethel or anywhere else in the area, you could do that. I used to use a local uh, farm vet because I had a small diversified farm. Bo well, we used to be a farm, a farm dog. And, um, we like to play with the pigs and cows. <laughs> And and when we go into deliberative session at, at the end of the evening, would that be your suggestion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I will I will move that we close um, this hearing and that we uh, go into deliberative session at the conclusion of the. Um, uh, this evening's regular select board meeting and then report out to all the parties involved with our decision. Is that? Will that be by a phone call? Or It'd be usually email. a letter, isn't it? I think it, what you can do is right after this what, right after this vote we take is go out and work out a plan for how the medical care of the dog. The town, we're not going to have anything to do with that on this. This is literally going to be Get it, get the rabies shot, get it licensed, you know, and then what the conditions are. We've done like, it has to be in a fenced area or you have to under your control or things like that. And again, just to reiterate, he has never, under my personal control, with me ever done anything like this. I've always kept my dog, when it's with me, safe.
things happen. Unfortunately, I think you got two separate issues going there. I, I know. And it probably got a little confusing I, on who's doing what and how is. that all and plays. And if you read, but if you read all the stuff, there's a lot of confusing things. Yeah. There's unknowns and this and that. But I want to make sure that I do whatever needs to be done. Okay. So I think your best path is to have a conversation about yeah. where you want the dog to be seen, uh, who you want to be seen, where he is. Right. But you can go okay. work that out with. You. Can we get a second on this? Second, that motion. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the dog hearing. So moved. Uh, <laughs> second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. So can we get you to take a brief pause in between and maybe we can connect to the Ethernet and solve some of this stuff? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey folks, on Zoom, we're going to try to restart the machine. If you get kicked out, please sign back on. We're hoping this will connect us in a better way. We'll be looking for you. So if you get kicked out. See how awesome we are? All right, we're going to call the select board meeting to order. Um, and Milo, 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 can you take that upstairs, please? Yeah, close the door. Thank you. First up is public comment. This is public comment to the select board at this point for something that's not currently on the agenda. And I will tell you, I'm going to be strict about the two minute rule. So go. I'm Betsy. I'm from East Valley Community Group. I'm a teacher. I believe in visuals. Do you believe in snacks? And if my two minutes, and if I'm done and I don't get finished, we just want to give you an update of what we're doing and where we're at. Um, you know we've got the slogan, bringing it back. And we've got uh, a lot of community drive going on. This is going to be several phases of work. You all know this. Um, the initial project, and these are somewhere in some sequential order, is the foundation, which the estimates are, that you're seeing there are based on the bread loaf um, uh, inspection and architectural assessments that they did. The structural stability, which needs to go on, will go on during the foundation time along with that, is about another 250,000. Bread loaf put it in at 465,000. The ADA, compl ADA compliance and fire codes, these have to happen in order to open. Uh, restrooms, handicapped lift, entrances, electrical, 255,000. Building longevity, um, that's siding, exterior doors, lighting, insulation, painting, that doesn't necessarily have to happen in order to open. Currently, the EVCG has raised 45,000 in funds from private donors and fundraising that we've started our capital campaign. We have four active grants submitting totaling over 400,000, ARPA being the largest request. Future projects, roof, kitchen, clock tower, landscaping, those are all down the road. Um, we do want you to know that speaking of the future, we get phone call, I get phone calls wanting to know if the hall can be used. Uh, running into people at different places wanting to know if it can be rented. I've had calls from undertakers. I've had calls from. Uh, <laughs> I'm flattering. <laughs> Two of them, you know. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. They don't have places for families to get. To yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, I, had a call, I had a call from a state committee wanting to know if there was wow. something. Um, wow. Chamber of Commerce, White River Valley Chamber of Commerce. Linda tells me that. Uh, she, they have people calling all the time for places, wanting places to meet. So I think this could be a very well-marketed um, uh, property of the town. And now that there's online marketing, which is pretty effective, it could generate for the hall. And... The hall's have never a lot been of income. Marketed. That's the, the big thing. We get all this attention, no marketing ever. We start marketing, it's a whole different world. 
and it adds increased attention to the village, enhances property values as well as economic growth. Um, we have two questions for the select board. Would the town apply for municipal grants and we could help with funding? The grants that we're trying to apply for are not as big as what the town can apply for. That's what we're finding. Uh, we hope to see the value in restoring your hall. You hope you we hope you see the value in restoring your hall, and you'll put this high on your list as accomplishments on the select board. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for us? Okay. Oh, okay. I just want to Any other public comment? Seeing none, we'll move into approval of the agenda. So I move have approval of the oh, well. Before there was the one change, if you're willing to consider it, would be to the public assembly permit. Our ACDC just wants to set a rain date for the next first Friday event. That's right. Yes, that's so it would be you amend your agenda to include that as part of I'll move, 5D. Basically. I'll move approval of the agenda. Uh, five, is it 5D? Right? Yes, yeah, 5D. Sorry. I'll move the approval of the agenda with the um, with the amendment that we consider a, um, a public assembly permit for RACs, RACDC rain date um, under 4D. Uh, uh, um. <laughs> so move. Second. <laughs> Approved? I don't know. <laughs> motion and a second. Second. <laughs> Aye. 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 Aye
And then so then the other question is, do you want to try a special meeting so that you could possibly appoint someone before the September meeting? Because there's about a five week gap in our meeting schedule just based on how the calendar falls this year. Do you want to do a special toward the end of August or do you just want to do it at that September meeting in one shot? So those are the two real questions for you. How do you want to advertise and appoint, you know, go through the appointment process and then do you want to do it in the in-between or at a regular? So in the past, have you been through, have you been through this <laughs> Um, I've been through this path personally um, in another in another life jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a total different life yeah. <laughs> jurisdiction. So. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> we've advertised in any way we could to get the word out, um, and then we've allowed everybody that applied to come in and meet with the board. We've already passed uh, in the past, <laughs> and then we kind of narrowed it down and one time we had I think we came down to two one time we came down to two and we had equal two of us wanted one candidate two of us wanted the other and so we went without one for a while but um, right. right it's uh, we didn't we didn't allow them to be called through by somebody else like all the applicants came to the board members we all met with all of them right and kind of talked about what was important to us. It wasn't like a job interview, so we didn't have to stick with standard questions or whatever, but. Are those interviews conducted in public? They are. Okay. So it's a special meeting or at a regular select board meeting? Either way, it's. I think it it's not an executive <laughs> session. One right? person or two people that apply. The, or is the decision discussed okay? in exa if deliberate? You have 10, you can consider. True. Yeah. Then you want to probably go with a special day, I would think. Yeah. I. August is a tough month to hurt cats. <laughs> well, the, but, I think uh, we got to see how many people apply, right? If you get yeah. one or two, you can do it at a regular meeting. If you get ten, okay. you're stuck yeah. with a special. I, I don't have a sense that people are going to be knocking the door down. Um, so but, why? I'll just you wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. We're pretty fun bunch these days, so. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, August is a little tough. I would rather just kind of. I think we advertise, see how many there are. As we get close to the September date, figure out. Oh, wow. So the September 14th is our, our September okay. meeting. But if we have to, we could meet earlier in September. Right. Special. Right. And right. do something. How many, how, how far in advance do we have to warn the special meeting? It's just 48 hours, right? Yeah, we. It, I mean, it's special in that it's off your regular calendar, but we'd warn it like it were a regular meeting. So it's, yeah, the 48 hours, no less than 48 hours. And the deadline for advertising is when? Okay. Oh, in terms of posting everything? You're just talking yeah. about... Yeah, so for a Thursday meeting, we have to post by Tuesday. No, no, for advertising the vacancy. Oh, so what we'll do is probably set it out and set um, some kind of deadline. And then at this point, we might set it at least two weeks out. Yeah. Um, possibly even three, just because you have enough time. Mm -hmm. And we'll see. So you'll yeah. have to set it out a ways, because you got to get it in the Herald. But you're not, you're yeah. not mandated a certain... Time frame, right? Not for the advertising piece, oh. no. no. The, the pieces that are mandated that have a time frame associated with posting of the notice of vacancy, and then there's that time element of forthwith. Well, getting it in a herald is just getting it in by Monday at noon. Well, yeah, but that's... I was just saying, uh, yeah. you got to wait for Thursday for the right. paper to come out, right. and then you yeah. got to give them time. But we it. could conceivably have an add in, have an add in mm -hmm. this Monday for next yeah, yeah it would come out on the 17th. We'd have it online yeah. in a few places, too, in Town Hall. And then and Front Porch Forum and Floyd's and all the usual suspects. Yeah. Right. Um, so. And then if we had a deadline of September 1st for applications, that'd be three weeks from tomorrow. Okay. September's hmm. coming. And then that would, if we had a lot of applications, we could decide to maybe do a special meeting on the 7th of September, for example, one week before our actual select board meeting. Yep. I would, I would really. That, what's that? Well, works. yeah, yeah, but it would, uh, it would give us, and that's Labor Day week too. And I don't know. I think, or given all the that. things that are on the, on our plate this fall, that having somebody on board for the September 14th yeah. meeting would be. I mean, we've got the whole police services committee issue. We're going into the budgeting cycle a week or two. I mean, a month or two later. At least they'll, you know, if they don't come in until October. You're going to hear about some more stuff tonight, too, with flood recovery. With about what? Flood recovery. 
okay. decisions so, that we so, have to yeah, make there's on that. A, the, the, there's a bunch and, of and we've got the ARPA f decisions to make. I mean, there's just every reason in the world. Are you saying to we're somebody. not competent? <laughs> What's that? Are you saying we're not competent? We need somebody to help us? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, That's been alleged <laughs> by some. <but. laughs> We won't go there. All right. I can't read, we so that. what do I know? Get that pretty well set. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, talk about the topic nobody wants to, which is setting the property tax rate. <laughs> Can we wait until uh, we have another select board? I'm kidding. No, I don't blame it on them. <laughs> <laughs> Pin it on the new kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Mimi is here with us. You had some materials from her and Dennis in your packets to consider about the rates, sort of the usual, not only the breakdowns for this year, but also giving you sort of a multi-year comparison. Um, to the extent that there's ever good news in anything related to taxes for folks, the more conservative estimates we put in place when we were talking about the budget, um, when it was before voters, whether it be for the general fund, or the revised police fund budget, those rates are going to be a little bit lower than what those estimates show. The reason for that is that those grand lists grow. I mean, basically, in the simplest terms, grand list growth was a little bit more robust than those projections, and so those rates are, are down a little bit from what was forecast. So that's those are a couple of good things. More grand list growth than you expect, and a slightly lower set of rates than, than you expect. This is independent of the school rate, which is up and has its own process uh, of being set that I wouldn't even dare to wade into. Yeah, so that the public is understanding. Um, maybe Mimi could walk us through the changes and explain the, what we do have control over in town government and what we don't have control over. Sure, sure. Um, so the tax rate basically is the municipal budget divided by the, the grand list divided by the municipal budget. Um, we are in charge of our own grand list in the municipality. The difference with the state tax, the, the education tax, is um, they don't use our grand list, the municipal grand list. Not anymore, not since Act 61 in what, 1998? Yeah, Act 60, yeah, 97-ish, yeah. Back in the 90s, what they did was they decided so every kid could have um, an equal access to education. Um, you know, like some kids in Chelsea would still have the same payment budget as kids in Woodstock, whatever. Um, is that what you want to know? Like, am I going too far back? No, that's okay. good. <laughs> I think some people um, feel okay. like this so, controls oh, everything in that tax rate, yeah. so that's what I wanted to... Okay, so what happens with the state education tax rate is um, the state, we all pay into a state grant list. Every single municipality, or whatever. We all pay into a state grant list. And the state then divvies that up for everyone else. Um, and unlike a municipal tax list, um, that's where our CLA comes into play, where um, if you have like a house that the fair market value is like 200000 but we only have it assessed for 100000 the state's like, well, do you understand you're not fair market value? So we're going to apply that CLA and get our money anyways. Whereas a municipal tax rate, we don't apply the CLA to make up for fair market value. So I think that's like the biggest difference. I mean, it can, that's good, right? Right. Any other questions? I mean, it's so, the state tax rate and the education tax rate could be like an hour, I feel. Um, <laughs> so uh, basically, when we look at the change yeah. that people are going to see in their tax rate, yeah. 10 cents of that change yes. is all education tax. It's all and that's education. part of the budget you vote on separate. The, this separate. board has no jurisdiction over And I brought, I don't know, like if you guys want to, for fun, you can always go, or maybe it's fun for me, um, but you could go on the PVNR, the Property Valuation Reduce website, and put in search engine um, state education tax rate, and they have like a really cool um, 
BiMAP that you can compare your town's education tax rate in CLA to everyone else's. Um, one change this year is we used to call it the non-residential tax rate, and now it's called, the state has changed it to non-homestead. But the jump in the education tax rate has nothing to do with my office at all. Or what this board does. Or what this board does. It's two separate grand lists. Mm -hmm. And we just, um, we're just the messenger. <laughs> but, um, we're the bag man for the Yeah, basically. like if you want changes, like, you know, work on the legislature. Um, do that. Uh, but so, yeah. Um, so I gave the board, um, because Dennis and I like math, we like to show you how we did the math. So you have that, and you can check it against the town report, you know. Um, but we use the amount voted to be raised by taxes. So there's two, when you vote, you know, you have the two amounts, and we use the amount voting to be raised by taxes, um, plus the special appropriations, um, and that gave us a general fund. We divided that, what do you guys, you want me to go through this list? Um, no. And we just went through the whole thing to get to basically the municipal grand list divided by the budget equals our tax rate. Um, the police district has its own grand list, and we divided that by the police budget. Um, the local agreement tax rate is basically the veterans exemptions. The state will pay and accept on the education grand list $10,000 per veteran we have. The town voted at some point to do the extra 30000 and so that's on us to pay into the education tax rate. Um, so that's what the local agreement tax rate is, is the special appropriations plus the um, veterans exemptions divided by the grand list, and that's where that tax rate comes from. And the general, the overall tax rate includes the general fund, the highway fund, and the library fund. And then with whether it's police or those, the amount to be raised by taxes is what the budget set by voters minus the expected non-tax revenue, and that's how you get to that amount. So it's already factored out any of those non-tax revenues that are expecting in each of those. So with that before us, we have the new rates, which have, are based on budgets the voters have already approved. Yep. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and unfortunately, it looks like the education tax jumped a lot this year. Yeah, the one thing that made the education tax rate jump so much, and why it didn't jump last year, is because last year, what the state did with its emergency funds and part of like the COVID relief, is they took extra funds and boosted and bolstered the education grant list, you know, from all the money that they weren't able to make, so the tax rate wouldn't change. And this year, they, they didn't put extra money into the education grant list like we did last year. So, um, yeah. And the issues with the CLA are being addressed through the reappraisal process that's well underway? Yeah. Well, I think the important thing to point out, though, is in 22, the education tax was $1.56. They put money in, it only dropped it to $1.54, but this year they're after $1.64. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, they saved us two cents and then nailed us ten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they sure did. Um, I think part of that is our CLA. I mean, it's one part of the equation, one part. There's more parts. All right. Any questions by anybody on the board? <clears throat> not, could could you explain what a CLA is? I'm kidding. In 25 <laughs> words or less, you would, you would be forever in my uh, admiration. That would be a hot commodity. You certainly <laughs> would. <laughs> I've, I've written about it, and I don't under. I mean, I'm not sure I understand it. Challenge so. accepted. <laughs> not right now. Just no, no, no. <laughs> All right. Anybody want to take action on that one? Uh, a motion to approve the property tax rates for fis fiscal year 24. And I will second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Reluctantly, it passes. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Next up, we have a request to appoint Rachel Arsenal to the Development Review Board. I'm guessing you're, we communicated, but we've never, never seen you. You're Rachel, yes. then I'm guessing, yeah. yeah. Rachel is here. We have materials supplied in advance. As I mentioned in the report, you have at least two seats on the DRB um, with expiring terms um, of different lengths. One that expires essentially at the end of March or into April of 2024, and the one that expires in 2025. I don't know if you have a preference, Rachel, for either of those. Um, I would say the longest, the longest sentence allowed by law. <laughs> so there's certainly room. Uh, here to. I'm here for the six months. And yeah. <laughs> I did 20 something years on it, so yeah. we could sign uh, in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Anybody on have any questions so. on this? Yeah, do you need anything? Any questions on I don't. I know Rachel. I feel like she'd be a great candidate. Is that a motion? I, oh, I, I'm, I'm, oh, sorry. I do as well, so I would second yeah, I that motion. Second my emotion. <laughs> second that emotion. Well done, Tom. We're moving. Okay. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations. Carries. Just sit through all we that. We have a permit request. Run, but you can't hide that was <laughs> New World Festival and a request to add a rain date to first Fridays. Questions? Anybody have any so questions on those? Um, do you want me to hold it then for a little bit? I'll move that. Okay. So, so with the neural one, we've been working through some of the traffic control stuff. We were hoping to resolve it tonight. We may have to do sort of a special action a little bit later once we resolve that. Um, and it sort of reflects the fact that law enforcement has been in flux from last year to this one, if you can imagine that. And so Scott and the, the doer director of the channel have been working through that community. So we may want to just stick a pin in that one until we can resolve those. Things. Would we have to? Could we do that by email? I, I think we would probably go just based on the timing yeah. with that. You'd approve it and ratify it. Approve it tonight and then ratify or, it per email. Hit, or it, approve hit it. it there once it's all set and then. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Or we can approve it once Scott is comfortable with it. I mean, you could also do a conditional motion where to satisfy. It, if it helps, I mean, where we're at right now is uh, in regards to uh, one officer at what times. Um, it's a question that they're going to go with Randolph PD. It's for how long at the contract rate? <clears throat> and then would they likely bring in an outside, like so the concert services or something? The like traffic that? control pieces are being uh, conducted by the Norwich Cadets. And then that's typical. Yeah. yeah. And then the law enforcement entity would be uh, that contracted officer. And we'll probably have a officer in the village anyway, so you'll. In essence, you'll have two, one on normal control, one doing the detail. Mm -hmm. Is the way that's looking to shape out. And it looks and sounds like the event itself will be relatively similarly structured, if not identical to years past. I noticed that Chloe from Chandler is on up on the Zoom here, so if you have any questions about the event or for her, um, hearing available as well. So you could do a conditional motion and then essentially say you approve it pending resolution of any issues. Uh, about the, the police coverage and I, I will move um, that we conditionally approve pending resolution of issues about police coverage. To uh, whose satisfaction? To to the satisfaction of the police Randall chief. police chief. Okay. And that we approve the rain dates for and then first second, well, be a second, second, second motion. Separate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can yeah. Yeah, let's do it separately. Uh, yeah, let's do that separately. Um yeah, and then, uh, you know, one thing we've talked about but haven't actually done anything about was this removable garbage, too, and that's, has that been an issue at all in the past? Mm. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of, because we have, we have a volunteer, I'm saying we because I used to be right. the director of Chandler. Right. Um, there's a very dedicated, long-time volunteer trash crew that um, has always taken care of that. So. Okay, for the main builder. <laughs> like All right, we have a motion, but we don't have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Hurry, CBC. All right, thank, thank you all. Thank you, Bye, Chloe. Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> Bye bye. We have an RACDC rain date.
Um, so it's adding the eighth as a possibility. So September first is the regular. September eighth would be the rainy. Day. So I would I would move that we um, uh, <coughs> approve an amendment to the um, to this special event permit to allow for a, a September eight rain date. Um, before I second date, Scott, do you have any questions about that or any concerns? I know it's kind of more of a low key. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay. So I'm sorry for that. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, by request, Bethel Emergency Committee and Vermont Council on Rural Development want to discuss the White River Valley Intermunicipal Regional Energy Coordinator. Dear Lord. Hi, that's me. Nicole's <laughs> <laughs> cool. cool. here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so my name is Nicole Sear. I'm the resigning chair of the Bethel Energy Committee. I love oh, come join it. I'm resigning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I grew up here in Randolph. Now I live out in East Bethel. I'm half a mile from Randolph. I'm half a mile from South Burlington, depending on which way I go. Um, so we're in that little corner. And I've been the chair of the Energy Committee for four years. Um, I've had the opportunity to connect with neighboring towns in the White River Valley, including Randolph. And as we talk amongst ourselves, um, I've been noticing gaps. And I, I like noticing gaps. I have a master's degree in business administration. I love organizational process, strategic planning, all that stuff. So we're noticing these gaps. We're short on volunteers. The people who we do recruit, they're, um, they don't have the industry knowledge and they don't always have strong administrative skill sets. So sometimes great for outreach, staffing a table, but when we talk about something like, should we install an electrical ve electric vehicle charging station somewhere, um, you know, our conversations are really falling short. And this is happening from town to town. Um, and we can see this quantified in the T-Work report card that came out in 2021. Um, and you all got one here in Randolph, too. I'm not sure. Does anybody remember that? There we go. <laughs> I was on board yet, so. <laughs> so Randolph got a C. Pretty much everyone in the upper White River Valley got a C. So that shows us we're falling short. And there are specific benchmarks for the year 2025. And I know we're not gonna reach them in Bethel, for sure. So as the energy leaders have been collaborating, we're saying, what can we do to realistically meet that benchmark? And we're looking at the idea of coordination. Should we hire a coordinator? We stole this idea from T-Work. They have an intermunicipal regional energy coordinator, IREC, um, who serves like Sharon Barnard Woodstock, seven towns banded together, went to T-Work, and they're like, let's hire somebody. So those towns, and if you also look in the data that accompanied the select board packet, those towns that already have a coordinator have really high median incomes. Like Norwich, Vermont is included in there, the highest one in the state. Um, so we're, obviously there's a difference between us and them. The, the towns we're looking at, Upper White River Valley, Tumbridge, Brookfield, Braintree, Rochester area, we have low <laughs> median incomes, below state average, all of us. Randolph is the highest one, and it's still below the, ran the me uh, Vermont state average median. So, I know that Gary approached Randolph in 2022 about the idea of possibly collaborating with other towns. Um, do you all remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't here yet. So that, that idea was floated, and at that time we're all pulling in different directions. And I'm over here saying, let's make a timeline, let's make a plan. <laughs> so I applied to VCRD for human resources assistance. And I've been working with Laura Cavan Bailey from VCRD um, to form the, the assistance we applied for was to host a discussion series in the White River Valley. We want to pull back this energy coordinator idea and say, is this really a good idea? If we get everyone in the room together, are we agreeing that maybe we should pursue this? 
that's the purpose of the project conversations we're right in the middle of right now so I'm here today to give you an update on that the conversations have been so productive having a higher like a she's not hired by us but a professional moderator coming in and helping us talk to each other um, there's VCRD teamwork vital communities um, they're all involved in this conversation they have a representative coming out um, also we have a representative from VTC and from Tri Valley Transit who have been on the fringes tuning in um, so that's what's happening right now with that and what I sent to you all was the notes from meeting number one. And what we did, I don't know what to put down or pick up. <laughs> what we did is we got together. It was a smaller meeting to begin with. We had Bethel, Rochester, Royalton, um, nobody from Randolph at that one. The people I've been connecting with here have been Susan Mills. She's still on the energy committee, it still exists. <laughs> um, and Larry Sackowitz, I've been including them in Kim. I sent Kim a lot of updates. Yeah. <laughs> so even though they weren't present at this first discussion, the people who were said, you know, what are our assets? What do we have going for us? What are our challenges? And then we brainstormed a list of ideas. What can we do? And we came up with somewhere around like 10 ideas. And we sent them out in a survey and said, Everyone who can't be in the room today, or you know how volunteerism is. Sometimes you just need to do a survey. So we threw it out there, did it over a month. Um, and when we got the results back, we had, which I did not send around yet, because these are very new. When we got the results back, there was 10 towns who responded. And the biggest vote was establish a structure to hire an intermunicipal regional energy coordinator. So at this point, the group is saying, we want to pursue action items related to this project. And we made a list of action items. Uh, one of the top five is find out which towns are genuinely interested, um, which is also part of why I'm here tonight. Um, and you know, also create a position description. So. You know, something that I want to plant a seed in everybody's mind is if this becomes a reality, what do you need help with? Do you have specific projects, tasks, grant writing is a big one. On our survey, volunteer coordination was a huge one. If we can just get people, motivating people, you know, sometimes you just need that mechanism where there's somebody right in the middle saying like, yes, I will help you with the project and connect you with this person. Um, so I'm going to pause at this moment and let you all absorb and give me any questions if, if you have any popping up in your mind. Um, when you talk about creating a structure um, outside of, of Two Rivers, or, or because that provided the structure for the seven town Woodstock Barter that you referenced, right? Um, and it's... Well, you've got to have a parent somewhere. Right, right. right. That person's so, got to be yeah, on somebody's yeah. payroll. Right, right. I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just trying to clarify what you mean by establishing a structure because the structure is already there. It's just a question of where this person is going to live, right? Rather than creating some whole new entity, right? So. I'm just trying to get some clarity on what you mean by that. It's a good question. So meeting number three, we're going to be fleshing that out further. There is the possibility of T-Work being the parent. Um, there's also the possibility of one of the towns hosting this position. Probably Randolph or Bethel, realistically, because they're the only two towns with town managers. <laughs> I can't imagine any other town really yeah, much wanting to pick that up. <laughs> Yeah, so, like you know, there was also a position. Do you all remember Stephen Bauer? Yes. Oh, yeah. But he's now the zoning administrator in Woodstock. So, his position at T Work was to be a regional energy yes, coordinator for everyone outside the seven towns. And he was funded yeah. through ACCD, a grant through there, and he was hosted by T Work. 
So when we say establish the, the structure, we're, we're trying to flesh out those specific pieces. Where's the funding going to come from? Who's going to be the host for this person? Um, and then going on job description, what are they actually going to do? And there's flexibility here, because this is an unprecedented role. We're really breaking through, and we're ahead of the state and, well, other rural towns in the state and the mm -hmm. country just by having this discussion about how to reach and, the goals. And what's the Council on Rural Development's role in all of this? So VCRD, um, we're familiar with them because they've come through, um, you know, they did R3, right. they did Rochester Area Climate Initiative, and so they were doing, the program is called the Climate Resilient Economies Community Program. Mm -hmm. Got that a little backwards. Um, and so the, the reason we have their human resources assistance is because we wrote a proposal to that program and were accepted into it. They're going to leave us after the third meeting. <laughs> I've been saying the whole time, like, just please don't leave us. We really need someone to keep this going. And we're trying to consider how to plan um, the in-between, how to keep volunteers motivated. You know, at our second meeting, we had a higher turnout. It was virtual as opposed to the in-person first meeting. And that was really encouraging for me to see other people feel comfortable showing up because they had bringing the stronger skill sets. And that's really, when you have someone at the top who's able to manage that, you get those stronger skill sets. Um, so yes, that is how VCRD got involved, and we really appreciate their help right now, but they're leaving us soon. I guess I would say don't close the door on the other towns. You may have somebody that is on a select board or is in a leadership role in that town that this is a passion for that might take that on and thrive. Um, but I would also say, you, when you look at a place and where this type of effort ought to be located, look at their capacity, because we're at max right now for the town of Randolph, and I don't know that we could take this on <coughs> and a staff person and, and head it up um, right now. It, I don't think that means we, don't, we aren't interested or we don't want to have some level of participation in it. I don't know what that level is, and I don't know who would do it. Um, but I do think you should consider all the towns and see, because you may have somebody out there right now that's just very passionate about it that would take it on from Chelsea, maybe, or from wherever. You know, it do, I don't think it has to have a structure that has a town manager. I, I, def I think that's a good... Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good comment. I appreciate it, too. Is somebody um, from T-Rourke participating in the third meeting? Yes. Yeah. Is We're that? working with Harry. Mm -hmm. They sent us Harry Falconer, the Merp guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other two, the Kevin and Peter are, you know, they're in the loop, but they Kevin have Gardner. not showed up to the meetings. They said Harry. I, I just think that seems like, I mean, the easiest path to follow is to maybe ask them to put a proposal together based on the previous one that, that, that Stephen ran and some kind of numbers for the multi town. Like, I'd be curious to know to that how much did Woodstock, how did they, how did they decide who paid what to contribute to that effort? Was it based on population or? It's a little bit difficult for me to understand because there's two ways that I heard. One, they divided the hours by town. So it's like a total of 500 hours and he worked like 20 hours yeah. at one town. Um, and the other way that I heard was by per capita. So you know you have 500 in Pittsfield, 4,000 in Randolph. Right. You, you're not going to be paying the same. Exactly. Um, but I'm not 100% sure on that and that's another thing. We're at the yeah at the third meeting. These are all things that we're going to be uh, fleshing out. So these yeah. are great comments, and right on track with what we're asking to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just seems like that the role models there, the structures there, the T work capacities there, where it, isn't, it surely isn't here. <laughs> um, and it just seems like since it's already there to. Um, 
try and maybe emulate that model. Uh, I'm going to let you talk to the current IREC coordinator. We have um, looped in Jeff Grout, too. <laughs> um, and he's, you know, um, Laura contacts him, like, as needed. Yeah. And kind of know him, but, yeah. A little bit. I'd be reaching out to Commerce and asking if they're going to give you a grant to cover it again, too. How long is that good for? You know, yeah, with awesome. your phase off process. You know, they might pay for it for the first three years, and then you got to have a plan of what you're going to do after that. That would be amazing if they would uh, help oh, fund it. Is. I'm just saying that lots of right. times they only give you seed money. Oh, right, yeah, and then to get it going. Yeah, so it's um, something to keep in mind again. Also, why I kind of rushed here after the second meeting when I saw it going that way is that there could be a budget request coming up. Um, you know, we might put, we might be coming back and saying, hey, we have the specific job description laid out. We have the formula for how each town is going to contribute. And then we'll lay it before it's the budget committee. Um, so I guess one of my questions for you tonight is if we were to do a budget request, if this does turn into that, when do you need that by? Sooner is better than later. We want to start the process earlier this year. I'd be the intake because I'll probably be in the driver's seat for that again. And then it runs through sort of a budget committee and then comes to the board sort of as just the general flow. So in Bethel, it's October 16th. That would be awesome. Okay. We, we don't have a preset schedule yet, but we'd like to be substantially through a first draft by the by Halloween, essentially. Yeah, so we're, we're pretty much going for October with this. And it's, you know, something I, like, want to mention but don't want to, like, rally the, everyone too much is I really don't think we should have to tax people who live in a below the median income full 10 towns, all of us are that poor. I don't think we should even have to raise our own taxes. I think we should find state funding for this. Like, this is the plan that we as voters ask for and we need. I wish the tax lady was still here. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I would really love to see this, if we can push, um, use our voices right now, leverage this moment, because we have VCRD's attention, T-Works attention, vital communities, so we don't have capacity in Bethel either, and we need to say this as loud as we can to get the help we need, um, and that's a big part of what this project is about for me personally, growing up here. So let's leverage it. <laughs> <laughs> When is your third meeting? It's coming up in September. I can add you to our email list. We're going to do an online poll, but it's to get the exact date. But we're circling around like the first week of But it sounds meeting. like Larry Sackowitz is probably in that loop already. He's in the loop. Yeah. I mean, you know, not everyone who's in the loop is like <laughs> right. right on it all the time. So yeah. the more people in the loop and are informed, I think in this case, because it's a very short project, that's appropriate. Yes. It's not like we're doing like, like steering committee recruitment. I right was just now. thinking in terms of when our September meeting would be and whether you might be able to come back to that with a, a progress it's report. Probably possible. Yeah. You're the second Thursday here? It's the 14th yeah. of September. 14th right? of September. We should probably meet before then. I don't want to promise anything I can Right. But it's I just. Pretty likely. It's, it just seems like it's a work in progress and maybe by then there'll be a little bit more. Yes. Meat on the bones of this idea. Of the job description piece, yeah. Um, yeah. definitely. <laughs> and whatever comes out is going to be, um, it's going to depend on what goes in. So definitely inviting people to put their input in now, rather than waiting for that last bit when we're all trying to like rush. Because again, after that third meeting, we're, we're losing Laura. We're not going to have her. <laughs> so just get it all in while we have that human resource to help mm -hmm. us process. Mm -hmm. Um, so, kind of questions for you, yeah, just be thinking about specific tasks or responsibilities. Any other organizations that maybe we should connect with that would benefit from this? Um, Randolph isn't, isn't quite my playing ground anymore, so, you know, the Energy Committee isn't really doing outreach for us for this. Um, do you have budget requests? We got that. Um, are you in touch with RACDC? because they have some stuff in the works there, too. And they may also need another source of um, posting and employee and all that stuff like that. Uh, I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well they're like another contact, at least. Um, it sounds like really interesting. Yeah, everybody's yeah. Kinda, I mean, yeah. they're, they're, 
doing a fair amount of work on uh, energy with their own proper uh, energy issues with their own properties, including uh, new developments and putting in a microgrid um, in in their most substantive development that's going to be happening over the next three to five years. Uh, that's drawn national attention um, because. Um, it's, it's become kind of like a, a, a pilot project or a template for what other uh, affordable housing developers can do, uh, nation, agencies can do nationwide in terms of microgrid technology. So it, there is some interrelationship there. Yeah, I, I don't think yourself. they have the capacity mm -hmm. to, to house this position, and it's really a little bit out of their purview. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's definitely a good one. Um, and they were kind of on my mind too, but I wasn't sure if they'd be a good fit. So it's not not for hosting that position, just in general to be looped yeah. in. So yeah. it's good to get that feedback. Um, do you know if you have taken advantage of the Merck mini grant for community capacity, the smaller four thousand dollar grant? We are in the mix for that, and then some staff are going to be Monday on that grant. Oh, nice. What are you doing for it? I think that's, there were sort of two options. One was um, to return to some of those energy analysis type questions we've had, particularly for buildings like Chandler. And then the other one was more specific to pool pumps. In particular. Oh, right. Nice. So and is there... a big energy hog and not a very exciting project, but, we, but there are better options out there. So those and are the two that have come up so far. So who's leading that? It's not Susan, because she, she says she's kind of stepped back. No, no, it's all internal. It's Mark Rosalvo has been in the primary lead, and then Rex staff is going to sit in on the, for the pool pump conversation. So it's the economic director and the rec. Yeah, cool. rec for the pool piece, yeah. That's exciting. Um, and that really shows how you can kind of have different ways to boost capacity even without the energy committee. Um, and are you interested, or have you done, greenhouse gas data collection? Do you know what your annual carbon footprint is? Okay. Good to know. <laughs> if, if we were to go the way of the energy coordinator, that's probably going to be one of their first, you know, um, any scientist, what's happening now. Okay, so that's good to know. And those were my questions for you. Are there any other questions for me? Yeah. Okay. I can always so. connect you if you think of one later, too. Yep. <coughs> Great. Great. So, kind of tentatively come back in September with an update. Zoom will be working. <laughs> <laughs> you got it working, yeah. We just needed to reset everything. It was the solar flares when the <laughs> Earth was facing the sun. <laughs> That's my theory. <laughs> They've been very well, bad the past few days. Actually, there's supposed to be a potential for. Uh, Northern Lights over the next two nights. So we'll yes. After midnight. Yeah. We'll also be oh, here. We'll so still be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be seeing visions of our own uh, <laughs> creation by then. Tom, do you want to be on the list, the email list? I would like to, but I, I, I'm just overcommitted. Um, I hear you. Don't do it if you're overcommitted. Yeah, yeah. Let Larry I, do it. He's on the uh, list. I'm one of those people <laughs> that tends to say yes to things, and I'm like, why did I do I that? Know. So, uh, right. plus I'm on the RACDC board, which is why I know um, some of what they're involved with now. And we've got a lot on our plate there as well in the coming months. So I, I, I need to respectfully decline. Okay, good to know. I will not email. <laughs> but Kim, I'll be sending you. But I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> but Kim, you. Yes. Right. Right. Any other questions? Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Next up is updates from the July heavy rains, as they've been called by the state. Yeah, the rains, huh? Is that what we're calling July heavy rains? Well, except they went into August, so yeah. I don't know why we would call them July, but... <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we'll probably just keep this as an agenda item for a while here, especially as we move from response and immediate rebuild into some of the reimbursement some of the other larger questions that are looming out there. Um, I think the temporary bridge, if not fully installed today, was pretty close. I think they got through the last pieces. We had a chance to talk to John at the end of the day. Um, they did. I was there before I came here. Yeah. And then Braley Road was reopened. I think late last week we were able to reestablish the road piece. There was no 
bridge damage there. Um, rented some equipment to essentially come around a long way through some fields um, to bring material and equipment in. And so that's at least reopened. So that reopens all of those pieces. There's still some of that limited traffic issue um, with North Randolph Road as we await. One of the things we're going to need is for some sort of analysis of that half a mile or so of uh, slope where there's been some destabilization so that we can figure out what the best options are long term for that. What road was that? I'm sorry. North Randolph. That was North Randolph. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a piece that will extend into the um, into the coming months. We filed our um, PRA, our public request. I forget exactly what the acronym is. It's a necessary thing you've got to file to get to the FEMA queue. And so we did that. Um, and that kicks off the process of getting somebody assigned to us from FEMA. We haven't had any contact or anybody reach out to say that it's them yet. Um, but that at least is, is in the works, and so it puts us in that queue. And they've certainly had their hands full with the, mm -hmm. the scope and scale of the disaster statewide. Um, FEMA advised that it would be two to three weeks before they assigned a project manager for us. Yeah, so it puts us probably closer to September then, based on around Labor Day, this mm -hmm. case. We have brought in some extra capacity to help us get coordinated and organized. We use some internal capacity. So the whole idea is to get us in as good a spot as possible before we have to start to file for reimbursement and those pieces. Um, and I think we're in pretty good shape. There's some edges we'll have to round out, some things we'll have to add, but um, everything's pretty, pretty good. Most of the road damage was out in East Valley, um, which we covered before. So it's, if you looked at Route 14 on a map and just kind of went up the sides on either end, you, you'll find most you go of it. all the way to Williamstown and all the way down yeah. to East Bethel. That's hmm. exact, yeah, that's where it seemed to have the most impact. Yeah. And we still find smaller issues that we've had to address where, you know, sides of roads have washed down under mine, finally given way. Um, so there are some of those smaller things we've had to, to go out and respond to, or at least be mindful of. Um, so we have one road that's Federal Highway that uh, disaster report is completed. Yep. The work is completed on it, so we shouldn't have to go into any further with that. They'll catch the paperwork up and, and clear that one. The rest of it's all FEMA. Um, the temporary bridge is a state bridge, and Randolph's the only town that was approved to have our own crew install it. That's a huge testament to John. Yeah. And, um, but we do have the Smiths here with some concerns about the North Randolph Road, and I filled them in some on the geologist and the mess we're going to get into with FEMA on that. Um, very valid concerns that the last time FEMA tried to close the road on us, it took us three years to push back and finally get it so we could armor that one bank. This time it's both banks, both sides of the river. Um, so if you haven't been over there, the bank on the farthest side of the river let go. That's what pushed the water over, undermined the road down through there this time. Even where we had armored it, it pushed down a further up the road, up the hill. Mm -hmm. And it undermined that and then got behind the rock that we had oh. put in. Um, but this time it goes from above the intersection of Rogers Road and it comes all the way down almost to the almost to the bottom where it meets 14. So the guardrails, the last guardrails there, actually I was out there looking at it and it's all, cra the road's all cracked on the road side of the guardrails. So there's not much holding those guardrails right now. So we believe though that we can still keep the width <coughs> of Rogers Road to leave that open to two-way traffic. But below Rogers Road to Kibbe Road is gonna have to be one way. Temporarily, or until we can <coughs> fill the FEMA again. And that was three years last time. So we keep use, so. keep access, keep emergency <coughs> access. Right, right. And then keep it in use while the FEMA conversations. Yeah. Ongoing. So the concern was was pretty valid that we not narrow it up because they got to get farm equipment through there. Sure. Um, 
but it also creates a hardship there in that if they can go up from the farm to their fields that are above, they can't <coughs> come back down. It'll be one way up because of the fire department coverage area. So, um, but they don't even have, there's no access over to Kibbe Road to come back down that way. There's no nothing. So, you know, what I was talking to some of is when you're coming back down, put somebody at the bottom, hold up traffic while you bring your equipment back down. But granted, it's kind of a, it's a pain, but at least we're going to be able to have the road open. I don't, I can't think of another way to get you back down through there. I've been sitting here playing the area through in my head and haven't got there done. Well, it's from the Kibbe Road to 14 going to be two-way traffic. Yes. Well, that is going to be. Yep. The road is four, or the bridge is 14 and a half feet wide, so you can't meet anybody on the bridge, but you can clearly see that yeah. somebody's on the other side of it. Right, right. You know, there'll be signage saying it's a narrow bridge. But and I guess the, if you're a daredevil, you could. Down on the Cribbler corner, they've got a barricade down there, or? Down on which corner? Uh, below the bridge, you know, where the blocks are. Yep. So you said it's undermined there? Right. Um, not, looking at there? that in the morning to determine, there's a question about whether the town staff can do that or if we're going to need somebody to come in. And yeah. Anything we do there is going to be temporary. It's going to need a lot of bigger fix. Oh. It's pretty It's pretty interesting when you go down through there. It's not pretty. The one little landslide that happened the other day on the opposite side by the, that retaining wall, though, that got cleaned up pretty quick. That was easy. A couple scoops of dirt, but... What are they going to do by where they put the new bridge and where a lot is slid down and it's just sitting in the brook? Isn't that beautiful? Are they so, going to have to clean that out or...? <clears throat> you got to get permission. I said on TV that we got to leave these logs in the brook for the fish. Wow. That weren't there before. I know. <laughs> um, so that's the, you're talking about the slide that just happened yeah. the other night? Yeah. Yep. And uh, so we're looking at, that was being evaluated today, actually by John, yeah. on what we can do. There's a, if you haven't been reached out to yet, you will. They're looking for damage assessments from the storm mm -hmm. the other night. That will be part of it. Yeah. Uh, to see if they're going to, if they, if they declare it a, emergency we'll have the same period of time where we can go in and clean it up uh -huh. uh, but they haven't declared it yet so we can't mm. quite get the equipment in there yet and <clears throat> it's uh we have another storm and all that's in that brook bridges yep it's not an if it's a when yep and that bridge will have to go through a hydraulic analysis and all that to determine what ends up in there yeah. yeah. So my guess is they're gonna we're gonna probably see a a much bigger structure in there. Is there a the going to be on this temporary bridge? Um, my understanding is there is, but it's not <laughs> bad. Um, shoot, I heard it too. Is it? Um, it'll take a fire truck. Yeah. Easy. They're going with the default state. A lot of your big trucks go up at North Randolph. I know they do. It's not as steep as 66. Or I know. They might not be able to. It'll be quieter on the road. Um, some of that we got to work out, too. Yeah. Like we're, what we're going to be able to, to put through there. Our worst problem, problem is going to be getting from the field back down to the farm. Yeah, we've got to be able to get up and down that road. We can't go all the way around. Well, unfortunately, we don't have the width there right now, and we can't put it, and it, so we're going to... What about the width of the road down below? We can't meet a bicycle on that other road. Yep. That one's a, that one's a class four, right? And North Randolph is a class three, so it's different standards that we have to... I feel... 
I got it. it's, it's, I totally get it. It's Jerry, so I just road up there, even where it's bad. I mean, there's plenty of wet. You could still put up a barricade and meet a car where it's bad on the head of the road. So the barricades, it, it will evaluate where it's safe to put the barricade, and then the rest of it's there. If you can get two cars in there and meet them, but I'm afraid if you got a piece of equipment that's 10, 12 feet wide, well, I, I, that car width isn't I there. I think you could. So but, but there's enough visibility <coughs> there so that you, know, you, can just you can see, you know, you could make accommodations for meeting somebody, just wait for somebody to go through or whatever. It's, and uh, so it's going to be closed from the Rogers Road all the way down to Kibbe Road. So you won't have visual. So in following what we're going to have to do, right, under the guidelines, we're going to have to close it and yes, put it to one I way. Understand. What I you mean, do, <laughs> I'll hear it from my house, but I may not see it. How often do you have to go up and down that stretch? Excuse me? How often do you up and down? I bet some days it's 10, several 15 times. times. Several times a day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're haying or something, you've got to keep going. Yeah, with I mean, one of the I have to haul my mower, my tether, my rake, my baler, and, mm -hmm. you know, I... Well trod, then, yeah. You're up and down. Yeah. Yeah. And even like springs, <coughs> they draw all their feet up and down that road <coughs> up in there, so they're going to have... Yep. They're going to have to change their route. Oh, it's not a good scene. I totally agree with you. It's not a good scene. I mean, unfortunately, there's a process. Um, our hands are tied. See, in the 70s, when I sold on the land for this road originally, I sold the town five acres. I <coughs> really know about that. It's when they put the road up where it is. And they got more land on the right-hand side going up than what they used because they purchased more land because they said if anything ever happened, they wanted to be able to go that other way more. But, of course, it's steep there, too. Yeah, and, and that's an option, right? Yeah. Like we talked about, you can go over, but yeah. and we got retaining walls there, too. I would donate whatever land they needed if they wanted to do anything for nothing. If they were going to do anything more, because... It's no value to me for the land that's there, you know. Yep. Nice. Thank you. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're going to be, as we talked about, there'll be studies, there'll be all kinds of good stuff we'll have to do to, yeah. to get through it and get what the option is yeah, and, and move it. But, well, I We're hoping, um, well, we're hoping the bridge itself will be open, I think, Monday. Monday's the target, I think, is, yeah. the, is the target. So, hopefully that end of the road will be open mm -hmm. Monday, and then the one-way will go in. So, do all your hands this weekend while it's raining. <laughs> say, you, can't, you can't be going up through there that much this year, Jerry. Nobody else can. <laughs> uh, but if you see more slides or whatever, let us know too. And you're going to see them. I was there tonight and I took a video of uh, where on the lower part where it all washed out on the roadside, on the bank on the other side, the water's running right out of the middle of the bank. And that's what gives you your landslides. So yeah, sure we're going to lose more on the other side too. Yeah. <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. 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 All right. Do we have any other flood update stuff? Not that I've got. Mm -hmm. More. Yeah. All right. Um, so Tom Blond didn't ask to be on the agenda, but he left. Oh. No, he was. He had to go. Yeah, you lucked out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Take care, guys. Thanks for being here. Next up is consider accepting uh, libraries interlibrary loan courier grant from <coughs> Kemba Library. This is a. <coughs>
This Amy's is the annual grant that we do every year. Amy's here. She hung tough with you. All right. Do we anybody have any questions on that one? I do not have anything. <coughs> I don't either. Is that a motion I heard? Are you going to make it? I motion to. Um, Sucky. Okay, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I oppose. <laughs> motion carries. Consider awarding Thanks, a paving Amy. bid. <laughs> we ended up with two responses. Oh, the bridge will be weighted at 90,000 pounds. Oh. Oh, yeah, that'll be good. Sorry, came in a little late. Um, so we had two respondents to our paving bid. Um, we've got a breakdown in your packets. Um, shows you the sort of cost by bid or in by road. Um, so we are proposing to pave, and it works out to. Um, what did I say in the report? How many linear feet are we trying to do this year? So this will bring us up to. 32,000 linear feet over a two-year span. Um, and so we're trying to pave a, uh, an average of 1.82 miles per year. That's to get treatment on everything um, within a 15-year period. So we've got to do that many. This we're averaging 2.02. We're just over that. Where it's going to get tricky is when you project into the out years. If we don't find a way to <coughs> boost those transfers. But the two options we have in here, Springfield Paving and Blacktop, Springfields came in at about $348,000. Uh, Blacktops came in at about $387,000. When you look at the bids, you can see that the price per ton for asphalt is lower in the Blacktop bid. The difference comes in with the tonnage, which is lower in the Springfield Paving bid. Springfield Paving, if you remember, did the Weston little section of school, Fish Hill Road paving project in the summer of 2021, summer fall. We're about on the same schedule as last year. We have an end date of October 20th. This is a little bit later than we'd like to be. Some of that is because we waited on a class two paving grant award notice that came into June, so we had to readjust our plan a little bit. That grant would have enabled us to do all of East Bethel Road, and so instead we had to try to take the segments we thought would fit within sort of our <coughs> paving footprint and still address some of the areas most in need. So there's two sections on East Bay, Bethel Road. One's the really short one right by VTC up to South Randolph Road. The other one's a longer stretch. There's a pavement scene that heads on down to the intersection with Crocker. The rest of the paving is down here in the village area. Most of what's proposed will actually finish off, for the most part, finish off from Weston sort of over to the river and back up there. So we'll have a section knocked off. Um, at some point, we have to go in and look at St. Dudley and some of the other smaller things that may still be hanging out, but that will get nearly everything um, on this side of town. And we're also going to do Hard Race, which has been, um, it's in rough shape and it was very much in you know, a need-based pick. Not to say that there aren't others, um, um, and then we'll try to finish up. Do, do we have any means of determining if the difference in the asphalt tonnage is related to, I don't want to say quality, but to, I mean, maybe maybe more asphalt is needed than um, Springfield thinks. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a paving guy by any means, but. It, uh, yeah, I mean, their numbers, when you look, they're not, for the most part, they're not terribly far off on the tonnage. It's just when you add that sort of $5 or so per ton up across the mm -hmm. number of tons. Okay. Um, you know, it's the difference between 70 tons and 80 tons for Woodsy, for example. Um, yeah. And so they generally tend to be off by a smallish factor that compounds over the course mm -hmm. of, of those things. <clears throat> um, and these include the, the bond prices that are in there, too, so that's a small component of it. We have sufficient funds in the paving re re um, reserve to pay for these once the transfer comes in and we look ahead to at least fiscal year 25, we should be able to stay on um, the plan that we're developing. When you get much beyond that, if you don't sort of introduce either some other revenues, we don't get a lot of help from a grant program. We'll have to move some stuff around. So we have a history with Springfield, but not with Blacktop. Is that accurate? We haven't paved with Blacktop since <laughs> I've been here. I don't know if they've paved prior to that. I, I've encountered them for smaller jobs, I think. Um, just going, you know, just. 
couple instances. Well, we had really good results with Springfield. We were very pleased with the paving job we got mm -hmm. two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Weston was great. Yep. <clears throat> and they have both indicated they can meet the timeline. And so these bids also, they're all in cost. So when we talk about East Bethel Road, there's shoulder gravel, centerline painting, those things are a part of that as well. We like to break out the asphalt cost per ton because when we put our plans together, we try to touch the key metric in there. This is much more than what we were expecting based on last year's bid, bid prices. In terms of it went from about a little less than 100 bucks a ton to 100, either 105 or 110. And we're forecasting <coughs> with at least 5% increases year over year for that. So. But yeah, we'll have done roughly, um, it works out to 22% of the road miles once we finish this. Um, we'll have received resurfacing since late summer 2021. So we're on a, on a pretty good pace. Doesn't, I think, always feel that way to everybody who's driving around. But. There'll be extra done too, because there's some roads that were paved roads that had flood damage. Yeah. And that'll all get patched in also. That's right. So we'll actually have more than. Yeah, so some of that will. Much pleasure. <clears throat> I, I would move um, approval of the bid from Springfield Paving for the uh, fiscal year 24 paving bid. Second. All those in favor? Um, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is ratifying the. Purchase of the replacement truck. So teach me to go on vacation. That's the moral of the story. I think. <laughs> Hi, you came back. It was all. <laughs> yeah, sure I I like, well, let me leave you a list next time. <laughs> I went back. Oh, yeah, I went to the beach. Came back, the owner of a truck. Um, <laughs> right. It's been no, worse. I told you. <laughs> Next time I'm going bigger and better. <laughs> I was thinking famous? about going for two weeks. So I'm not sure. <laughs> So we had a, a, be more time. <laughs> a truck that was, um, uh, we had someone who was out on a truck, in a truck during the storm event, um, lost control of the vehicle. The vehicle was subsequently then totaled, and so we had to replace it, especially with winter, not super far off. So there were two quotes to replace this truck. We're going with a DF 550 size, so it's a dump body and plow on it. It's a um, pretty versatile piece of equipment for us. The price is about $92,000. The equipment reserve does not have that in it. Um, the cost of this truck will be, the replacement will be offset by the insurance proceeds. We're working to schedule the appraiser to come out um, so that they can, we can start to at least figure out what that dollar amount is. So we will have some amount likely, um, above and beyond a deductible, that we'll have to figure out how to fund once that's in. Um, the idea is to there is more than sufficient funds in the gravel road reserve, especially when we look at all of the projects and <coughs> projects that might happen. Um, we could still fund a couple of them and not come close to needing to be see forty or fifty thousand dollars or so that, that may be left unfunded. So that would be the temporary source and we would repay ourselves either with the capital transfer for this fiscal year and then sort of reduce the amount that we start with in the highway equipment reserve and or we would do it in say fiscal year 25 just to provide a little more breathing room for the equipment reserve and part of the reason why the equipment reserve is as low as it is is because we have been on a, on a pretty aggressive re replacement plan for trucks and equipment over the last few years and we had a very aging old unreliable fleet of all kinds of stuff so we've been able to get quite a bit of that replaced throughout that time. And so this sort of unexpected one that has a partial funding source is the one that kind of sit to figure out. So we can figure that out. That's that's the way we'll we'll do that and then we'll repay that reserve so that it's all there when we do want to do dig on a more substantial project, which wouldn't be until <coughs> fiscal twenty five or later anyway. And like I said, there's enough that if we wanted to be really aggressive with the project we can do that. So I motion to ratify the pur purchase of the replacement truck for highway department. And I will second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. North Wales and Reservoir Project update. 
Uh, we've been assigned an EPA contact for our congressional earmark. It's come as a grant from the EPA, so that's seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. So that's good. We're getting closer to locking that all all the way up. Um, we are still working to get the loan documents for the major funding source from the state. They are very much backed up on their end. Um, so we're a couple months past due for that, but because we did the interim financing, we're more than safe to proceed as scheduled. We're currently on pace, um, and wherever we need to be, the items that are still variable are the long lead time ones, and that's the tank and the generator, which we have sort of in the next construction season anyway, um, and we expect those to be in. Picked a color for the wellhouse block the other day. That was very exciting. It is either gray or brown. I can't quite tell. It looks like cement <laughs> with some shiny pieces in it. Um, had other people look at it, and they said, that looks great. I'm like, okay, I'm sold. So that building actually will be up soon. They're connecting some of the <coughs> wells, um, you know, some of the new wells back over, kind of filling some of those trenching pieces. Um, seems to be going as as we expected to at this point. Um, and engineers and contractors are all playing nice in the sandbox, which is also a which is good when the project has that. So that's just a quick update knowing that we're getting close to my bed. <laughs> Next up is the manager's report. Yeah. Um, the only question I had for you is we're still holding the check for the Chamber of Commerce for the July 4th events. Do you want us to hang on to that a little bit longer? Um, it's filled yes. out and ready to go, but we just don't want to send it to you. are not there yet. What's the issue with it? Um, they didn't follow through with some of the things that they said they were going to, like such as traffic control and funding volunteers, mm. um, different things like that that were an issue. Um, this was for the parade? It was for the parade, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I've been doing it for so many years, you would think uh, they have <laughs> well, uh, Sometimes there's new people involved in certain things, just in circumstances, of course. Um, you know, something that was really easy in the past was having police coverage, and it wasn't easy this year. Um, but I kind of drafted up. We were supposed to have a meeting that got canceled the day before with the board of directors and Trevor and Scott to come to have that conversation, um, and they canceled it. Um, so I would like to see like kind of a calendar of events, like they should be coming to us in January with a permit and like kind of show different, you know, progress and stuff throughout the year mm -hmm. before we hit, like the week before or the night before. Yeah. Well, but some of what we wanted to see was what, what they actually did that they think was worth 2500 Sure. Yeah. Also. Yeah. And, and so the check is for twenty six ten. It's got the one hundred and ten dollar mm -hmm. membership. I think is what pushes it. It's twenty five hundred for the. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll hang it a little bit. Okay. Maybe we can send on email and maybe ask for just like Linda, mm -hmm. and maybe a few of the board members to meet. Sure. <coughs> Whoever else would like to come to that party? Um, any, can you give us a quick update on the status of the police services committee? Either, either one of you, <laughs> yeah. or either anyone. I just met twice. Yeah. Uh, presented data at the last meeting. From um, the police department and the state police, presumably. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I kind of went over what that data was, and what was in it, how statistics are captured. I had a, a conversation about process going forward, what we want to do, kind of the timeline, how we're going to get there. Budget review. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of three phases, I think. There's sort of the mechanical getting everyone kind of grounded and ready <coughs> sort of phase. There's the... I'm going to go out on a little bit of a linear because I'm not on the committee, but I think it would behoove the committee to have a discussion at its next meeting about um, keeping its deliberations within the committee instead of in the pages of Front Porch Forum. Um, I was a little disappointed by the dialogue that went 
on there last week because when I voted to approve people to be on the committee, it was with the understanding, with, with the hope and expectation that they might come in with an open mind and not an agenda. And um, that doesn't seem to be the case. So um, I hope that if, I think having, like, there was a suggestion that Joe made about having a public forum. Well, that's what this, that's what this committee is supposed to be. So why not have the discussion there and not in the pages of Front Porch Forum where it just gets contentious and it descends into name calling and it's just, mm -hmm. I don't think it's helpful. On, on either part, no matter what side of the issue you're on, it's just not helpful. So I just want to go on record as saying that. Anything else on the manager's report? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you yeah. need a yeah. deliberative session for the regular psych work? Uh, you don't have to have one. I was going to update you on a few things, but. Well, I think if we need that, we should. Yeah. And we'll go right into the other one. Yeah. Do we have to find, or is this one that we don't have to find? I have it written up as the two. I don't believe you have to because of the two topics there, um, but it doesn't hurt to do the finding. At a minimum, you've made sure. <coughs> we're, we're, we're postponing it, right? I mean, no, we're, I'm I think we're going to do both. We're going to do both. Yeah, we're gonna do both. yeah I think, think the one, one might be a little bit quick. The deliberative session first or the executive session first? Um, what do you we'll do both the executive and the deliberative, right? Right, but which okay. are we going to, they're two um, separate motions, right? Gotcha. So well, the, we have the, the dog one, we already went, made the motion to go in right. after all this. Okay. So what we right. need now is to find that we <laughs> need to go into executive session okay. and then go into executive session. That's true. When you exit out, you're in public anyway, and that's when you can. And there's no actionable. Not for the executive session stuff. Okay. okay um, I motion to find that the executive session is necessary and prudent and that premature general public knowledge would place the town at a disadvantage. And I will second that. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Um, and then do the second thing too. Consider a motion to enter, <coughs> oh, so I would like to motion to enter executive session pursuant, I don't like all these, to one BSA, <laughs> Squiggly line, is that what is it? <laughs> I just give it and say, yeah, go right to the 313. <laughs> Section 313A1E, pending or probable litigation, and V on one DSA, what is it? Section uh, 313A3, appointment evaluation of public official. A second. There you go. <laughs> I was just getting really wrapped up in all those numbers. It's sort of hypnotic. <laughs> Good night,